Good afternoon. I'd like to ask the interpreter currently on the Spanish channel to commence translation of the meeting. For those just joining the meeting, live translation in Spanish is available and members of the public or staff wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in the Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Pablo, will you please restate this in Spanish? Bienvenidos a esta reunión. Para los que recién se unen a esta reunión, interpretación en vivo al español está disponible y los miembros o personal quienes deseen escuchar en español podrán unirse al canal. Para unirse al canal, haga clic en el icono de interpretación que ahorita aparece en la barra de funciones de Zoom, eh, pareciendo como un globo terraqueo. Una vez que se una al canal de español, también se recomienda que apague el audio primario para que solo escuche la interpretación al español. Hello and welcome everyone to our August 22nd, 2023 Santa Rosa City Council meeting. It is now 3 p.m. and we will be starting our meeting. Seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Councilmember Stapp. Here. Councilmember Rogers. Here. Councilmember Okrepke. Here. Councilmember Fleming. Here. Councilmember Alvarez. Present. Vice Mayor McDonald. Here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show all council members are present. We will now proceed to item 2.1, conference with labor negotiators. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on this item? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 2.1. If you would like to provide a public comment and you are in the chamber, please make your way to the podium. If participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one in the chamber to provide public comment and no hands being raised via Zoom. Thank you. We will now recess into closed session.
looking good. <laughs>
All right, welcome everyone to the August 22nd, 2023 Santa Rosa City Council meeting. It is now 420 and we will be starting our meeting. Welcome Madam City Manager, Madam City Attorney and fellow council members. Seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Stapp? Here. Councilmember Rogers? Here. Councilmember Okrepke? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Councilmember Alvarez? Count Vice Mayor McDonald? Here. Mayor Rogers? Present. Let the record show all council members are present with the exception of Councilmember Alvarez. We have no study session today, so we'll continue to item five. Madam City Attorney, may you please report out on our closed session. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A closed session was held on the item on the agenda and there was no reportable action. Thank you. Moving to item 6.1, our proclamation for the day will be read by Vice Mayor McDonald. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. I'm so happy that I get to read this proclamation, having served um, on the Commission on the Status of Women for several years, along with my fellow council member Fleming here. And so it, it is my great honor to be able to give this out today. Whereas in 1976, the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors established one of the first commissions on the status of women in the state of California with the purpose of promoting equal rights and opportunities that enhance the quality of life for all women and girls and addressing issues of discrimination and prejudice that negatively affect women in Sonoma County. And whereas women now constitute nearly 50% of our workforce, the majority of the students in our colleges and graduate schools, and an increasing number of primary breadwinners, and whereas in 2016 through 2020, Sonoma County women as a whole earn approximately 88% of what men earned. And whereas, women in Sonoma County are more likely than men to live below the federal poverty threshold. The greatest poverty rate amongst families is for those headed by single women caring for their own children. And whereas, even with the gains women have made, work remains to be done in many areas that directly impact equal pay for equal work, including access to quality, affordable childcare, affordable housing, and comprehensive health care for women, including reproductive and mental health care. Whereas Women's Equity Day celebrates the achievement of women and recommitting to realize gender equality in the city of Santa Rosa, including equal pay for equal work. Now, therefore, be it resolved that our mayor, Natalie Rogers, the mayor of the city of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire city council, do hereby proclaim August 26, 2023, as Women's Equity Day. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I would like to invite the representative that will be receiving this proclamation to make a comment at this time after comments are made by the representative. Uh, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? Hello, I'm Jan Blaylock. Um, I've been on the Commission on the Status of Women for eight years and four of those as chair. And this is my last year on the commission and it was really important to me to um, be able to come here and accept this proclamation um, that is so meaningful to us. And it is so exciting to look at the faces of uh, all of you on the city council, but especially the women. <laughs> we have a female mayor and vice mayor, and, and two of the women on this um, city council were commissioners. And um, although we still have a long way to go for true equity, um, it is very exciting to see that seven of the mayors of cities in Sonoma County are female 
and that's pretty amazing. It wasn't like that just a couple of years ago. So this is an area where we're seeing um, a lot of growth, and I think it's fantastic. Where we still need to work on um, true equity um, will come when we have more personal safety and affordable housing. It's important for everyone, but especially given the fact that uh, one in five households headed by single mothers with one to two minor children of their own live on income less than the federal poverty threshold. Um, poverty is a, a real issue here, and um, it's something that also affordable childcare would be very, very helpful for women to be able to get back to work and um, to be able to support their families. And comprehensive health care, including, of course, reproductive freedom and reproductive health care. Those are things that we really need to work towards and to protect um, in order to have true equity. But I appreciate you so much for this proclamation. And um, thank you so much. And best of luck to everyone here. I have also, we have um, Commissioner uh, Diaz here, Diaz Garcia here, so I'll have her join me if, if that's all right. Thank you. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 6.1. If you are in the council chamber and would like to provide comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. The first public comment will be from Eric Frazier. Thank you very much. I would like to use the overhead, please. Thank you very much. Certainly don't want to take anything away from the wonderful citizens that are looking for uh, equality and uh, let me see if I can get this a little bit higher, please. And so um, I did want to introduce you, though, to some amazing women that I've had the honor to know, uh, know their heart. And I want to introduce uh, just an, another way to look at this, and that's through the lens of freedom and free will. And sometimes I see a lot of times government engage in programs that actually work contrary to what they want to achieve, especially if they're not fact-based. And so I know in the proclamation I heard a number of different facts, uh, but um, when I look at city employment, for instance, I don't really see where those facts are applicable. And so, quite frankly, when facts are used just to carry forward an ideology, they, don't, they get in the way of freedom. And I think really the goal is freedom and human rights for everybody. So I want to introduce you to my mom. She had 15, went to the university to be a doctor. They wouldn't let her. She had to be a nurse and ended up becoming a um, pharmaceutical executive. Here's my third grade teacher, Delta Kelly. Uh, she was an incredible environmentalist, again, a font of free will and free thinking. Uh, here's my lovely bride, Marjorie. Marjorie has an interesting backstory. She was a product of rape. Her mother was raped when she was 15 by the most wealthiest landowner in Goochland County, Virginia. So she had to uh, be raised in a segregated environment. Uh, and known as uh, High Yeller in the process. We raised wonderful kids, including uh, this wonderful Tirza Nuria, who's an NEA artist, uh, many times older, over with grants, and now is working on her work at the De Young. Uh, everybody knows Rosa Parks. I was pleased to know her heart and work for her on civil rights issues. And here there's a quote from Rosa Parks here that says, I believe we are here on Earth, planet Earth to do what we can to make this world a better place for all people to enjoy freedom. Here's some local people you probably know, my great friend Paula Downing. I um, miss her greatly. She just passed recently. Uh, Norma Baumsteiger, not, not hanging around Oakmont much anymore, but love her heart, love her heart. Zen Honeycutt, a major food rights organizer. Adina Forares, she's an investigative reporter. 
that's very important to support. My point here is that these women intellectually would engage with me over the facts that drive their passion for equality and human rights. And they probably would not fall victim to sort of mamby-pamby type of planning over equality. Instead, we need to have real, sincere conversations in order to move the ball down the field. Thank you for your time. Mayor, I'm seeing no one in council chamber approaching the podiums, and we have no hands being raised via Zoom. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite you down for a picture, but first I want to sincerely thank you for, you know, pushing us through this struggle and knowing the struggle and doing something about it. So thank you very much, and thank you to school board member Diaz, Vice Mayor McDonald, and Council Member Fleming. Thank you so much for your work in this area. And if you would like to come on down and take a picture with us, we would be honored to do so. All right, item number seven, we have no staff briefings today, so we will go to city manager and city attorney's report. Thank you and good evening, mayor and members of council. So on Sunday, the Santa Rosa Police Department responded to a mutual aid request to the Smith River uh, Fire Complex. Staff will assist with the fire evacuation, some traffic control and emergency dispatching efforts, and crews should be on site at least until August the 24th. Last week, ahead of students returning to school, our transportation and public works crews installed new lighted crosswalks and restriped existing crosswalks near schools to help students um, as they crossed. Uh, these two new flashing uh, crosswalk beacons at Hohen Avenue and Sierra Creek intersection and Laurel Grove and Sebastopol Road at Cesar Chavez uh, uh, School and also cities also installed the Third Hawk, which is a high intensity activated crosswalk beacon at Fulton Road. Uh, this new crosswalk connects Piner High School to Youth Community Park. And last, on Thursday, August the 24th, Burbank Housing will be hosting a grand opening of the Caritas Homes Phase 1 here in downtown Santa Rosa. The project is 64 units of permanent supportive housing for which the city and housing authority provided nearly $9 million in financial assistance and 30 project-based vouchers. Thank you. And I have nothing to report. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on item eight? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item eight. If you are in council chamber and would like to comment but have not yet provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Here, there's no one approaching the podiums and no hands being raised via Zoom. Thank you. Item nine, statements of abstention by council member. Are there any statements of abstention? I guess we have a meeting, but <laughs> any statements of abstention? I'm assuming no. All right. 
So seeing none, we move to item 10, which are mayor and council members reports. Um, I will start us off. Um, there have been wonderful events around the city and I was able to participate in a few, including Catholic Charities back to school event, Santa Rosa Day um, at the fair, new hire and promotional ceremony for a Santa Rosa Police Department, the Wildfire Ready Resource Fair, um, and Summer in South Park event. I am continuing my tours of the fire stations uh, meeting the wonderful fire staff that not only respond to fire calls, medical calls, and many other calls, but also when time permits, brightens the days of our youth that drop by to view our uh, fire apparatus. I would like to make um, the EIFD appointment, um, and we will be appointing Hugh Fatrell. Um, to the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District, and I am doing that with um, permission of the rest of the council. Um, reporting on the WACTAC meeting that was held August 7th, Regional Water Supply Resiliency Study, um, an update was provided, which is looking at how Sonoma Water and the individual water retailer systems can be better integrated to withstand stressors and improve resilience, the impacts of drought and potential options for increasing resilience through drought have already been analyzed and now the team is focusing on earthquake, flooding, power loss and wildfire risk. Sonoma Water staff provided an update. Both reservoirs are very full and in great shape thanks to the forecast informed reservoir operations. Um, initiative by Sonoma Water. They were able to capture and store more water in both Lake Sonoma and Lake Mendocino, Mendocino, excuse me, providing us with abundant storage levels for this time of year. Related, PG&E has filed a temporary and long-term flow regimen change for Lake Pillsbury due to seismic concerns. The long-term change would be in a um, adamant, abundant to their current FERC license and could allow for additional flows to be diverted into the Russian River from the Ill River during the winter when Scott Dam is spilling. Um, and lastly, for the WAC meeting, uh, Sonoma Water staff provided an update on the grant fund at work to explore a solution for continuing the water diversion from the Potter Valley project. The Russian River Water Forum Planning Group has been established consisting of approximately 34 technical members representing various interests. The planning group has met three times The planning group has met three times. Most recently, the meeting focused on the Russian River Resilient, Resiliency Project. Um, and the leadership, which is made up of elected officials, has yet to meet, but we're looking at meeting at the end of, or by the end of the year. Um, in correction, uh, Hugh Fertrell will be uh, appointed to the Public Financing Authority. And there's more. COC report. Uh, during the last continuum of care meeting on uh, July 26, it was decided that the representation on the COC board would change in two ways. The first way um, that it would change is one of the three at-large seats on the board would be changed um, to be dedicated to a tribal member. Um, seat. This change was made to address racial disparities within our homeless system of care. Um, there is data demonstrating these disparities and the need for an indigenous representative seat on the COC. The second change is the LEAP board chair um, will sit on the board as a non-voting member. LEAP is the Lived Experience Advisory and Planning Board. Um, so they will now be on the board. And uh, the point in time count is out. 
uh, in late January, volunteers and guides fanned out across the county of Sonoma as part of an annual effort to understand the needs, numbers, and circumstances of persons experiencing homelessness. The point in time count measures the prevalence of homelessness in each community and collect information on individuals and families residing in emergency shelters, transitional housing, as well as uh, people sleeping on the streets in cars, abandoned properties, or other places not meant for human humans to, I'm not even gonna try to say the word because I'm gonna mess it up. Um, humans to be. So the point in time count is the only source of the nationwide data on sheltered and unsheltered homelessness and is required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which a lot of us know as HUD, of all jurisdictions receiving federal funding to provide housing and services for individuals and families experiencing homelessness. So the good stuff is uh, countywide, the point in time count identified 2,266 homeless persons, which is a 22% decrease from um, 2022. So 1,291, which is 57%, were unsheltered, and 975, uh, which is 43%, were sheltered. And in Santa Rosa, we had 1,160 homeless persons, which is 30% decrease from 2022, a reduction of 498 individuals. This represents 51% of the total countywide um, count compared to 57 in 2022. And 465 um, which is 40% of those individuals were unsheltered and 695% were sheltered. So Santa Rosa's sheltered count increased by 22% and unsheltered count decreased by 57%. Um, I thought it was very important to share that with you because I think Santa Rosa is doing a wonderful job and this is something that we should be very proud about. So that concludes my report, which was very long. I'm sorry. Anyone else have a report? Council Member Stapp. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll build off your list of some really nice events that have taken place in the community over the past couple of weeks. Um, Mayor Rogers and City Manager Marquisha Smith and I had the had the honor to attend the Family Justice Center celebration this past weekend, which raised over $100,000 for victims of family violence in the community. Obviously, predominantly women and children. Um, it was a, it was a great gathering. Uh, and then, as well, I'll just mention again the Sonoma County Fair. Granted, it's a, it's a county event, but it's held in Santa Rosa, and it brought in more than 140,000 individuals into the city over the course of its 10 days, uh, raised more than 2.2 million through the Junior Livestock Auction, auction for, for kids and scholarships, um, and let the record show that, that I myself was there six times. I, I like the fair. And that concludes my report. Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for uh, attending all of those events and such a comprehensive report. I uh, was, uh, let's see, uh, Catholic Charities uh, Backpack Giveaway. I want to thank uh, Jenny Lynn Holmes and her fantastic team for doing a great job of organizing. I, I think that the picture in the Press Democrat of the kid getting his hair cut with the one eye open was might win a Pulitzer. It was just so fantastic. Uh, th later that evening, I went out to Sonoma where there was mayors and council members, and we were definitely... Uh, represented by uh, our vice mayor, and we had a lovely time and got to hear some great information about ACA1 and the Democratic Par Party barbecue. Um, I very nearly beat Council Member Rogers at, uh, at the balloon toss, but he, he pulled ahead in the end, and, and unfortunately, I didn't get it. Um, we'll, we'll await his rebuttal. And then. <laughs> Uh, MTC takes the month of August off, but I'll be back to providing you with updates in September. And it's with a heavy heart that I'm going to announce that Mary Watts is no longer able to serve on the Board of Public Utilities. And I'm going to read some notes that she, as a 
consummate staff are put together for me, and I want to make some comments as well. So if you'll indulge me, this one means a lot to me. Uh, Mary Watts having to resign from the Board of Public Utilities due to her new position with the Federal Government Office of Community Services as the Policy Data and Evaluation Branch Chief for the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. Mary has served on the Board of Public Utilities since October of 2015. She's made it a goal of her tenure to serve with all ratepayers' interests in mind, especially those more vulnerable communities. She is mostly pr most proud of her work and oversight in the Help to Others program that helps low-income families afford their water bills, which is no small feat if you understand Prop 215. <laughs> um, she has served the last two years as the chair of the Budget Subcommittee and Water Conservation Subcommittee. Mary was delighted to see the Smart Meter project come to fruition, which allows customers the, the ability to log on to their portal and see water usage in real time, which is really cool if you haven't done it, and be able to make effective adjustments and conserve water. She truly appreciates her time on the Board of Public Utilities and looks forward to her continued work in water policy at the national level. Those are her remarks. I'm gonna go on a little bit for a moment here and just say, Mary served for eight years. She's a young woman in her mid-30s. And for some, one of the things, we'll get a report later tonight about board member appointments. And one of the things we don't look at is age. We look at gender, we look at race, but we don't look at the fact that many of our, our appointees serve because they can afford to because they're older. So for somebody in their mid-30s to have served on a traditionally mostly male board for eight years and to have done so, with such expertise and to lead these subcommittees is, is really truly impressive. Um, and her depth of knowledge and um, her commitment to this has been unwavering. And um, on a personal note, you know, Mary, when Mary ran for city council um, in 2018, we ran together and everybody said, you're not gonna be able to get along with this person. It's just too difficult a thing to do. And Never once was Mary anything but the most consummate, professional, kind, and decent person that you could ever, ever wish to know. And so it is with a really heavy heart and true sadness that I, I do have to release her from this position, and I hope that one day she'll come back, and um, I'm just proud to, to know Mary. I'm grateful for her service. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything they want to say about that in particular, but I'll conclude my remarks there. Thank you, Council Member Fleming. Rogers, did you have a rebuttal for Council Member Fleming? No, okay. Vice, Vice Mayor McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple things to report. Uh, Zero Waste met this last week and we adopted um, a model ordinance for jurisdictions to consider that will um, be an outline for building project materials, management, deconstruction, reuse, and recycling um, requirements. So that's going to be moving forward to staff for consideration and consideration eventually of council for adoption. So that was my official meeting, um, the mayors and councils meeting that we was held last week in Sonoma that I was able to attend and represent the city at. Um, we went over affordable housing legislation as well as some potential ballot measures that can come forward that will increase funding at a pretty significant level, level for us to be able to have um, affordable housing in the county and it, specifically in the city of Santa Rosa because we take on so much of the housing ourselves. I, at, I too attended the Sonoma County Fair, so I'd like council member staff to know that. I did go once, so I really wanted to say thank you to the board of directors for um, them hosting lunch for us and inviting us to come and have the Santa Rosa Day at the races. Um, it's an honor to represent the city in those moments, and we got to go down to the winner circle, which was quite fun, and take a photo with, um, with a horse as it won. I did um, attend the police promotion ceremony along with mayor and as well as some other council members. 
at the Democratic barbecue. I will let Councilmember Fleming know that I did beat her out, but Chris still hung on till almost the bitter end, which was really annoying. But um, last year, when he was my partner, we actually almost won, I believe. So, um, so clearly, he's getting the most deflated balloon as he's moving forward if he continues to almost win. I went to the Wildfire Resource Fair this last Saturday, and I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who put that on from the Rex Department as well as the Fire Department. It was extremely well attended at the Finley Center, and they gave out a, a tremendous amount of resources, emergency backpacks, and there was um, a lot of representation there. So thank you to all of those that were involved in putting that fair on this past weekend. And then I attended the South Park, I believe it was a health fair event, but I just want to say thank you to Annette for her dedication to the community and um, and everything that they're doing over there to lift everyone up. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Okrepke. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, I too attended the fair um, and Santa Rosa Races Day. Uh, congratulations to Lucy Treasure who won the Santa Rosa Race. Um, I did. Uh, attend something after that at the fair, which was the monster trucks, which my children uh, very much enjoyed, um, and is of note, not just because of it, the event at the fair, but because Skull Crusher uh, is driven by a 15-year-old, and I hesitate to call him a boy, because he's driving a 10,000 pound, 1,500 horsepower monster truck, but a 15-year-old boy from Cloverdale um, is driving a monster truck at a professional level, and it is a sight to see. Um, uh, the next day, I attended uh, Park a Month at Pioneer Park uh, over off of Peterson Lane. Um, it was uh, an awesome event. Uh, got to know a lot of the parks department and, uh, that are out there on a regular basis, taking care of our, our parks, um, interact with them, and see a lot of community members. There was these two teenagers that just came out with no other interest, but that's their park that they attend, and I've never seen two kids worked that hard at yard work in my life. Um, for three hours straight, they were just weeding and, and chopping down uh, uh, brush. It was pretty amazing. Um, I also attended the SRPD New Hire and Promotion Ceremony. Um, just one highlight of that is at the previous one, we had a member of the Chicago Police Department who had lateraled out here um, after he and his wife had gone on their honeymoon. She was a police officer in San Rafael. She is now a police officer for the Santa Rosa Police Department because she came over. So um, that just goes to show that uh, we have a great department led by a great chief. Um, and then finally, this last Saturday, I attended um, uh, a fundraiser um, put together by a company called Visiquate called Slava Palooza, Slava being the Ukrainian word for glory. And uh, it's most commonly known for a call and response, uh, traditional um, saying within uh, Ukraine that is Slava Ukraini, Heroyam Slava, which means glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. Um, it wasn't an ordinary fundraiser. This uh, organization based out of Santa Rosa, Visiquate, has over 200 employees in Kharkiv. Um, if you know anything about the invasion that's going on in Ukraine, that is in a very, um, to politely say it, hotly contested area um, and are in constant danger. And not only were we able to enjoy ourselves, um, but we were able to speak to uh, Ukrainian refugees who had gotten here uh, as recently as two months ago, um, talk about their experiences and talk to um, some NGO organizers doing things such as just getting simple things like body armor and tourniquets and another one who uh, flew over here from Poland uh, in Warsaw and his entire purpose is to outfit ambulances to get these people off the, um, the, the front lines and get medical attention as quickly as possible. Um, so um, Obviously, that is something, the, the Ukrainian invasion is something very important to me and my family, being of Ukrainian descent, but it also touches so many other people, especially co uh, corporations and companies that are based out of here that um, on day one of the invasion had 200 of their employees in harm's way uh, being shelled uh, on a regular basis. And I'm glad to say that, um, they've raised over $75,000 on Saturday for those efforts, uh, including a little bit from me because I bid on a hand-painted 122 million, uh, millimeter um, artillery shell that was used in Ukraine against the Russian invaders and was hand-painted by a Ukrainian artist and sent over here and gotten into this country legally, but somehow, I have no idea how they got an artillery piece over here, but uh, it was pretty, it's pretty impressive. So um, uh, that is the end of my report. 
Thank you, Council Member Okrepke. With no additional reports, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you. We're taking public comment on item 10. If you're in council chamber and would like to provide a comment but have not yet provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please dial star nine or raise your hand. You have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. The first public comment will be from Dwayne DeWitt. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I wanted to comment on the reports from the mayor. Thank goodness positive things are moving forward. But this grand jury report is from seven years ago. And we've basically been having all of these problems with homelessness for well over decades. One of the things that I think is really important right now, especially because the city and the county could work together to alleviate more problems is that the county right now has been having a hearing on their housing element. And it appeared that they didn't have any input with the city, that their discussion with the county planning staff was pretty much siloed. And I believe because the mayor here, uh, uh, Ms. Natalie Rogers, and others here are interested in these topics, you folks should be able to get some sort of a collaborative going because one of the proposals they're putting forward is that they'll have more housing on the outskirts of Santa Rosa. And that's actually anathema to what we've talked about for decades on trying to have city-centered growth in the downtown area to help the downtown business people thrive. This is not about Santa Rosa Avenue, Todd Road, Moreland Avenue. That's not helping the downtown Santa Rosa Avenue. And the housing that we could have down here downtown could be helping with these homeless folks. That's where many of them are right now in the downtown area. So thank you very much, Mayor Rogers, for spending your time looking into this. Last but not least, thank Mr. Councilman Okrepke for his interest in the Ukraine and our Santa Rosa sister city, Cherkasy, Ukraine, has been in existence now for almost 30 years. Actually, it's over 30. My first trip's like 28 years ago. The thing that we need to do is stay strong and make sure that we do not give up that democratic approach that those people are trying to do in the face of all the difficulties of being invaded. It's been nine years since they shot down the Dutch airliner and killed 240 people. It's a very serious situation that won't go away. So I'll leave you with this because earlier you had the woman's equity situation. <clears throat> and this is really important. It's been 50 years since we had an Equal Rights Amendment put forward. I hope you folks would spend time working on that. And this is from the Vietnam Veterans of America where many women did serve equally and they were very honored and honorable people in the service to our nation. So thank you for women's equity. Last but not least, we need a new flag at Southwest Community Park because ours is tattered and beat up, but we can still salute it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Frazier, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure again to address the council. Thank you very much. So uh, it's always great to see our elected officials out in the public attending events. Uh, very much appreciated. I am a little curious though about the mentions about the Democrat party for people that I thought are elected to a nonpartisan position. But be that as it may, uh, what we do see also, and I do share uh, Council Member Fleming's happy tears about Mary, Mary Watts's promotion, I think frequently we do see a system that works for civic involvement for young people to learn about their area. Uh, they don't need to be paid a lot of money necessarily because they understand that it's a segue to larger opportunities. Uh, with state government, with federal government, with the city government, with nonprofits, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I really want to push back against the impulse to, to make a big deal about uh, civic duty for people uh, and make it some sort of requirement or uh, plank of the Democrat Party. 
I also wanted to say that I did attend the emergency preparedness fair, and I have a little bit different attitude to report. You know, there was a giveaway of go bags there. They gave away 150 of them. I was told that the value was 80 bucks piece. That's a $14,000. Where's the FEMA money? Where's the PG&E money? Clearly, people were turned away uh, to get these go bags who are expressing a need for it. Uh, $14,000, it's like let them eat cake, I guess. Uh, what I did see was a layout that was inadequate to accommodate people in wheelchairs or people with disabilities. I don't understand that. I mean, people were literally on the brink of being pushed into the central fountain. Uh, there was um, scores of government workers there. I imagine everybody's being paid, probably some of them on uh, overtime. Boy, that's really great. Um, I don't really see the, and the other thing that really not at me is that here there's this whole short-term rental ordinance that required a lot of emergency preparation on behalf of those residential properties, but there is nothing that showed the seriousness of what was prescribed at the emergency fair. It just shows the fallacy of, you know, what you guys do in your regulations. So I didn't really see the serious commitment to emergency preparation there. It was great that we had access to our proud first offenders. We support them. We appreciate them. But as far as the central planning of this, it was really not well done at all. And it shows an inadequately met need. So I would hope that our elected officials get a little bit more on top of it and really prepare our citizens for the next uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you. See no one else in council chamber. I'm going to turn it over to our Zoom host. Thank you. First up will be Adina Flores. Uh, good evening, council. My apologies. I just joined the meeting. Is this non-agenda items? This is not. We're on item 10. Okay, I yield my comment at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. We have no additional speakers. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes public comment. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to item 11, approval of the minutes. We have one set of minutes, and that would be for August 8th, 2023. Council, are there any correction to the minutes? All right, seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 11.1. .1. If you are in council chamber, I would like to comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. If participating via Zoom, please dial star nine or raise your hand. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. I see no one approaching the podiums and I do see one hand in Zoom being raised for minutes. Please go ahead, Rhonda. Thank you. Adina, you've been asked to unmute. Good evening, Council. I uh, would like to thank Mayor Rogers for taking the time to meet with my fiance and myself to discuss our concerns that we've had over the past several years. Aside from Mr. Alvarez, I believe she's been the only other elected official willing to meet with myself and uh, my fiance. So I appreciate that very much. So I have Dina, just been, sorry, yeah. we're on um, approval of the minutes. So we have like oh. two more items before we're on non-agenda. Oh, my apologies, thank you. No problem. Mayor, I see no additional hands being raised via Zoom. All right, with no amendments, we will adopt 11.1 .1 as presented. Moving to item 12, which is our consent calendar. Madam City Clerk, can you please read the consent items? Thank you, Mayor. Item 12.1, Resolution Third Amendment to Professional Services Agreement Number F002259 with Best Best and Krieger LLP for Real Estate Legal Services. Item 12.2, Resolution Santa Rosa Tourism Business Improvement Area 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan. 
Item 12.3. Resolution ratification of grant application submittal, acceptance and appropriation of California Office of Emergency Services Emergency Operations Center grant program for the renovation and seismic retrofit of 55 Stony Point Road for use as an emergency operations center. Item 12.4, ordinance adoption, second reading, ordinance of the city Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa repealing and replacing Chapter 11.22 of the Santa Rosa Municipal Code, Section 11-22, Camping on Public Streets and Public Property. And that concludes the read of the consent calendar. Thank you. Bringing it back to Council. Are there any questions? All right. Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment. Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comments on item 12, the consent calendar. If you are in council chamber and would like to provide comment but have not provided your speaker card, please make your way to the podium. If participating via Zoom, please dial star nine or raise your hand. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. The first public comment will be from Gig, followed by Eric. Thank you, Mayor Rogers, members of City Council, Gig Hideau, Santa Rosa. Please pull item 12.4, the camping ordinance, from the consent calendar so unresolved issues and flaws in the wording can be corrected before it becomes law. I want to see this ordinance passed, but there are issues that still need to be clarified so the ordinance will not be invalidated if challenged in court and not subject to lawsuits if homeless people believe their rights were violated. Section 11-22.020A is a ban on camping in parks, whether or not an individual can obtain shelter. But this by itself cannot be enforced because it's a violation of Martin versus City of Boise. Section B also applies whether or not a person can obtain shelter and allows for camping in the city of Santa Rosa, so long as they can find a spot that fits within the restrictions one through six. I don't know if it would be necessary to identify where such spots are, but either way, if someone does find a spot where they meet all the criteria in B, that means they would be free to camp there indefinitely for the rest of their lives. This could have strong, long-lasting negative consequences for Santa Rosa. Do we really want to do this? Section C designates the way in which a person must camp when shelter is not available. Note that if someone is camping when shelter is available in a spot that meets all the restrictive criteria in Section B, they would not be subject to the 12 health and safety standards listed under C. This is a mistake in the ordinance because all the conditions listed under C should also apply to people legally camping according to B. And section 11-22.040A declares that any violation of this ordinance is a misdemeanor subject to prosecution. However, Martin versus City of Boise requires that homeless behavior cannot be criminalized unless there is shelter available. Therefore, when shelter is not available, None of the provisions listed in A, B, or C can be enforced by charging someone with a misdemeanor and forcing compliance with law enforcement officers. To make this ordinance in compliance with Martin versus City of Boise, Santa Rosa could either provide alternative camping locations or make provisions so that access to a shelter is always available to everyone. This could be achieved by having additional shelter space open immediately whenever the established shelters become full. And furthermore, to prevent permanent encampments in areas that meet all the restrictions listed in A, B, and C, there may have to be a time limit for legal encampments, such as a certain number of weeks or months or years. Please pull item 12.4 from the consent calendar to discuss this. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Eric Frazier. Overhead, <clears throat> if I could just get, have a moment just to be sure I have the focus right, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
still not sure if people can read it, but I stand in opposition to the SRTBIA report as a member of the assessed class. <clears throat> I identify the SRTBIA program actually as a classic example of um, rent-seeking organization. A rent-seeking organization by definition is an organization that uses government money but returns little value to the governed. Uh, so the SRTBIA is not an example of a public partner, a public-private partnership. Instead, it's a private fleecing of a public resource. Uh, the Metro Chamber is not a public organization. It purports to be a membership organization, but it gets most of, a lot of its income from the SRTBIA. And the executives that financially benefit from the SRTBIA sat on the advisory board. The Metro Chambers also spends money on political lobbying and gets you people elected. I don't think this is fair. Is the, is the SRTBIA a tax or an assessment? It's collected as a tax, enforced as a tax by the Treasurer's Office. Um, the, it, it, it's extracted from the transient guests and has to be paid out. There's no definition that gov governs how the transient guest pays. The recent short-term rental ordinance actually makes it a misdemeanor now if you're caught with a guest in your house, even if you're on site, you own the property and somebody's using your bedroom and you don't have a permit and you didn't pay your TOT. That's the most incredible thing. Uh, this SRTBIA business really, I think, fits the uh, classic definition of what a RICO organization is. It's a racketeer-influenced and corrupt organization. Furthermore, the, res the residential properties that have been forced to pay the SRTBIA have done so at about $3.8 million over the, the time that the SRTBIA has been in existence. Never have these residential property owners served on the advisory board, received communication, uh, have been invited to participate in the marketing. Uh, it's classic examples of scams. Questions for the city council, is your job to perform oversight on the city programs? Are you protecting the uh, constituents? The errors in the report are all over the place. Sorry you can't see this well, but this is the visitor center. Uh, Mr. Rumble claims that there's 60,000 people that have went there. That's baloney. At the most, we've seen 6,000. You have to ask yourself, does the, this provide a service to you that's not available to other people? In other words, is this your own personal travel agency to arrange benefits and perks as you travel around the world? I mean, seriously, that's a conflict. We'll get to the bottom of this. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Joe, followed by Dwayne. Mayor Rogers and City Council. My name is Joe Dietzen. I reside in the St. Rose neighborhood and work in downtown Santa Rosa. I am also on the board of the Downtown Action Organization. I want to thank the city staff for the work and effort to draft the camping ordinance, and I want to thank the City Council for its support of the ordinance so far, and to urge you to support it again this evening. The ordinance is very important to address both health and safety here in Santa Rosa. But I want to speak to one issue that's brought up by the uh, ordinance, and that's regarding fire. I've had experience with fires near our home caused by encampments over the years. In fact, going back to 1989, a fire started in a homeless encampment in a vacant lot next to our property. It spread to our property and burned down three garages that we used, plus tenants used, and a shop building. And it was only due to the heroic effort of the Santa Rosa Fire Department that the two historic Victorian residences on the property were spared. Last year, a fire started by campers in the basement stairwell of the former Catholic Chancery Building um, uh, was started, and that also adjoins our property. It was only due to my family's effort to first fight the fire with garden hoses and then in calling in the fire department that a larger fire was contained. I shudder to think what could have occurred if either of these had happened during one of the violent windstorms that we experience all too frequently and which have contributed to so much tragedy in our community. 
Now, the last thing I'd like to say is the or point out that the ordinance calls out that 23% of the fire incidences that the fire department responded to last year were encampment related. To put this in perspective, first remember that the head count of homeless in Sonoma County that occurred earlier this year, that was discussed in council chambers earlier today, counted 599 unsheltered individuals in Santa Rosa. Remember that the city's current population is 174,523 according to the uh, California Department of Finance. This means that one third of 1% of the individuals residing in the city accounted for almost a quarter of all the fires in Santa Rosa. Let me say that again, one third of 1% of the population in this city accounted for a quarter of the fires. These are people in encampments. Members of the city council, that has to be addressed. The ordinance in front of you begins to do just that. Please support it, thank you. Thank you, the next public comment will be from Dwayne, followed by Victoria. Thank you kindly, my name is Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from Roseland, and I'm also a part of the Sonoma County Housing Advocacy Group, which for years has worked to try to find ways to get more housing for the homeless. This is gonna surprise you. I think the ordinance has some good points, but I do believe you should wait. I do believe you have to make this thing bulletproof so that lawsuits won't tangle it up so that you can actually get the problems resolved. The information just presented by the previous speaker was stunning. If that can be verified, it's like, whoa. Now we get fires over in my neighborhood because of encampments. One of the things that I and many of the others I speak with in my area believe should occur is that the seven districts, each district should have its own homeless shelter. And in that homeless shelter, in that district, the people who are from around there can be where they're originally from perhaps, or where they've been staying most recently. Unfortunately, due to the way the Sam Jones former Army Reserve Center was positioned to be the homeless shelter with at the time stating there'd be 50 people. Unfortunately, it's become a place that's overwhelmed and the homeless come out there and in a sense, victimize the people of the Letty Park neighborhood, the people of the Fresno Avenue neighborhoods. The dilemma that we face is typically said to be financial. Well, we can't put those shelters in. You've got a nice big shelter now here at the Caritas Center. That'll help the downtown area. But that still leaves homeless people out in Bennett Valley, Rincon Valley. You may not remember that homeless hill was up on Bennett Valley by the Calvary Cemetery for well over a decade. Once that was brought down, most of those folks migrated over to Roseland, where they then stayed behind what was called a Dollar Tree store, where you'd torn down, not you, but the county government, had torn down our community recreation center, a bowling alley, left it a vacant lot, then that turned into a homeless camp. Nobody should have to live like that. We should be able to house people, and we can do it, as been shown by a model that they did out at Las Gilicas with small, tiny home type units. So perhaps hold on to this, do some more approaches to actually resolving, getting those homeless people you spoke about into shelters throughout our town so not one district is overwhelmed, but all of us share the burden equally. That's what a democratic society would do. Thank you. Thank you, the next public comment will be from Victoria. Can you push this down, Dwayne? Good evening, folks. Victoria Yanez here, a member of Homeless Action, volunteer attorney, still practicing law, state bar number 123777, here in the county of Sonoma. I have volunteered my time at this point to helping those currently experiencing homelessness 
I wish all y'all would start using the politically correct phrase, because people aren't homeless. Their experience is homelessness. They're on Earth. Earth is their home. Now, that's what my sponsor always told me when I was homeless crying to her. You know, we've got a big problem here, Council. And the problem is that the same practices that were going on during the time that the, count, the city was enforcing its illegal sweeps on people that were sleeping or sitting on the sidewalk back a few years ago, about five years ago. And at that time, the current president or chair or director of Catholic Charities was in charge of homeless services for Catholic Charities. Uh, one Miss uh, Jenny Lynn Holmes. I will name her by name because at that time she was in cahoots with the police department on always having room at Sam Jones whenever they wanted to do a sweep. Wasn't that convenient? Oh, yeah. And guess what? The corporate culture still exists so that those in power know that any time they need to enforce any camping ordinance, all they got to do is let Jenny Holmes know. And she will make room at Sam Jones for them so that they can enforce this uh, ordinance. I want to let you know also that homeless action is not approved of this speech. I missed the meeting yesterday. So most importantly, you need to know that we're on you. We want to see, I'm requesting right now, public records of everybody who has been kicked out of Sam Jones. They're doing it without a written notice. We want some homeless civil rights here. That's a regular due process right to notice with an uh, opportunity to appeal. This is a well-established rule, Golden versus somebody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I see no one else in council chamber wishing to provide public comment, so I'll turn it over to our Zoom host. Thank you. First up will be Cadence, followed by Michael. Cadence, please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers, uh, Vice Mayor McDonald, and members of council. This is Cadence Hinkle Allenson with the Downtown Action Organization. I wanted to say thank you again to staff for all the work they've done to ensure that our city's legislation is in line with Boise as well as with other local jurisdictions. I won't um, I won't take up too much of your time today, but I want to reiterate our appreciation for your support of this ordinance two weeks ago. And thank you for your dedication to the health and safety of all those who reside and work and own business in Santa Rosa. Um, we acknowledge the complexities of this issue and the need for continued support of those experiencing homelessness, as well as addressing the impacts to others in the community. And this ordinance is certainly an important piece of that. Thank you again for your time and support today. Next up is Michael, followed by Natalie. Michael, please go ahead when you're ready. This is Michael Tatone. Um, I'm encouraging you to pull this item from the consent calendar for reconsideration. Um, this is item 12.4 is what I'm referring to. Um, this camping ban is extremely destructive and people selling this as being there to promote health in the community are overlooking the health of unsheltered residents who often need fire to either stay warm or to cook actually healthy food and not just stuff that you can get in a convenience store. Um, and the reality is that our warming centers, they're only legally required to be open if it's freezing outside, never mind it being close to freezing or cold. And the reality is that a lot of the shelter placements don't provide residents with stoves or ways to cook their own food. And so residents are that actually, you know, want to cook outside use fires. And there's a lack of non 
options and shelter options for folks. The reality is this is something that was evident at the last meeting when it was brought up that uh, city staff had received no direction from city council. And despite city staff saying that, to my knowledge, of the council members made a motion for them to start looking into actual places for people to go. And that's extremely disappointing because it says a lot about the priorities of this city when we're looking at criminalizing homelessness and banning camping without looking for places for people to actually go. We're deciding that people have overstayed their welcome in this city before we've actually provided enough sufficient placements for people that are available. Um, I believe that we need to look into safer placement options. We need to look into placement options that treat people with dignity, not concentration camps, not places where people are treated like a prisoner. Because again, we're not criminalizing homelessness. So we shouldn't create encampments by the jail that subject people to search and treat people like they're not full human beings with full rights. Um, I believe very strongly that we need to pull this item from the agenda and reconsider it. And it's possible that the city is going to be open to lawsuit because of the way that this is worded. And maybe that's what it's going to take to actually motivate council members to look into placements for people. And unfortunately, that's usually the case. But I just would like to encourage people to pull it now and get some placement options. Next up is Natalie. Natalie, please go ahead when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Natalie Balfour. I work for Airport Business Center. We own 50 Old, Old Corral Square and the Roxy Stadium building, so two buildings downtown. And uh, this is on item 12.4 as well. I think that you guys uh, should adopt it officially today. I wasn't here uh, when you guys uh, approved it last meeting so i just wanted to to jump on real quick and and say i do know staff spent a lot of time writing this up and you know for us as you know building owners I, when i went through i thought it was fair because I, I i don't think anything was too far and that's just my personal opinion um it looked like it, it didn't ban it's not banning camping it's saying here's some really good clear-cut rules of where it can take place um and i thought that was fair and it's still you know, it kept in balance the, you know, the, and I know someone mentioned this, but it really has to do with public safety and, and then state law. So I thought that was efficiently done. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to state my approval of that and thanks staff for all its hard work. Thank you. Next up is Butterfly. Please go ahead when you're ready. Butterfly, you're being asked to unmute. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. My name is Butterfly. I am currently homeless at the moment. Um, I was strongly encouraged this 4.4 item to be pulled as well. I don't know what what this plan is going to accomplish. Um, so I was going to start arresting people. I mean, the jail's going to be full. Uh, law enforcement could be doing other things than harassing the homeless. Then, then um, you know, there are more important things out there that can be done. Law enforcement. You guys have three shelters closing in the next month. And I don't know what what everyone's supposed to do. I mean, where are they where are they to go? Um, you guys are post part and IMDC team. They don't come out unless they're getting swept. Um, if they really wanted to help they'd be out here more often not just when we're getting swept or getting our stuff taken. Thank you. 
We have no additional callers on Zoom. We do have four pre-recorded messages that I'll play at this time. Hello, I'm calling today in favor of the new camping ordinance, agenda item 12.4. My name is Argo Thompson, and I'm the business owner of the California Theater of Santa Rosa on 7th Street. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the staff for the time and effort, and thank the council for your support of the ordinance thus far. I cannot stress enough the importance of eliminating camping on public property when shelter beds are available. Thank you again for addressing this important health and safety issue for our entire community. Hi, I'm calling regarding consent item 12.4 for August 22nd. Um, my name is Pauline Block. I'm with Cornerstone. We are a North Bay property owner and developer. Um, I'd like to send my appreciation for the dedicated staff time and effort put into drafting this ordinance. And also thank you to council for supporting this far. Um, I want to reiterate the importance of this ordinance in addressing the health and safety concerns for our community. Although I do serve on both downtown organization boards um, and there is significant impact on downtown, Cornerstone also deals with the implications of illegal camping at many of our other properties throughout the city and we do hear concerns from our clients regarding the health and safety issues that we've discussed. Um, I appreciate your time. I urge you to move forward with the recommendation of staff to repeal and replace the current code by adopting this ordinance. And thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Nelson, and I'm calling in regarding agenda item 12.4, the camping ordinance. I work in downtown Santa Rosa at Santa Rosa Plaza, and I'm a representative with the Downtown Action Organization. And today I'm calling in support of agenda consent item 12.4, camping ordinance. I'd like to start by thanking the council for your time and attention to the camping ordinance that is intended to provide a safer downtown that is welcoming to everyone. Our goal is to make downtown a safe environment place for our community. Loosely regulated camping on public property poses a health and safety concern for our shoppers, employees, and visitors alike. Camping has an unreasonable financial burden to Santa Rosa Plaza, including a sizable increase in costs tied to landscaping, security, janitorial waste hauling, and maintenance not to mention the safety concerns for our employees who are tasked to dispose of camping debris left behind. Camping also poses a fire risk as we have experienced multiple fires due to camping surrounding the shopping center. In addition, multiple national retail brands who have desire to open at Santa Rosa Plaza have reversed course after visiting the market and noted safety concerns surrounding downtown as the primary reason. The camping ordinance is not intended to be a solution to homelessness but it is one tool in the toolbox for addressing health and safety concerns for all members of our community and providing a safe experience to work and shop downtown. Once again, I appreciate your time today and I hope that you will vote in favor of the camping ordinance, agenda item 12.4. Thank you. Hi, this is Britt Cooper, DAO board member. I'm calling to make some comments on the uh, consent item 12.4. Um, I want to, uh, express my uh, appreciation for the staff time and the effort to uh, draft the uh, camping ordinance. I know there's a, a lot that has to go into that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, second, I want to thank the uh, council for their support uh, of the ordinance so far. I know there's you know more work to be done. And lastly, uh, just you know kind of you know reiterate the, the importance of uh, uh, the health and safety concerns for the entire you know, community. So, um, you know, uh, please take this forward. Thank you very much. Bye bye. And that concludes the public comment. Thank you. Vice Mayor McDonald, can you please make a motion? Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move items 12.1 through 12.4. Second. I have a motion made by Vice Mayor McDonald and a second made by Council Member Rogers. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote? Council Member Stapp? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. 
Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show the consent calendar passed with seven affirmative votes. Thank you. Moving on to item 13, which is our first public comment on non-agenda items. For the evening, Madam City Clerk, can you please proceed with public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 13, non-agenda matters. This is the time on the agenda where any person may address the council on matters not listed on this agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. If you are in council chamber and would like to comment but have not provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. If participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. The first public comment will be from Dwayne, followed by Cynthia. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I wanted to thank and actually congratulate Eddie Alvarez, the representative for District 1 for where I live, for hanging tough. He's been having to face a lot of difficult situations that aren't of his own making and he's going forward representing our community and doing good things. I uh, also wanted to offer some condolences on his family situation and just say, there's a lot of folks behind you, bro. So you just keep on keeping on. With that in mind, don't let it hold. I should rephrase it. I know sometimes when I support something that might be held against you. So please don't let that happen, bro. With that in mind also, big thanks to you for coming forward and saying that you would like to see Pomo Park and Preserve being a name for the area along Roseland Creek that people have worked for decades to save. You know, it's been really heartening to see some of the young Pomo folks come forward and say how glad they are that this is going forward. One of my Pomo friends walks the area every day in honor of his two brothers who had worked with us over 30 years ago to try to save this land, and they have now both passed away. Pomo Park and Preserve, bro, that is the stuff. And you know, I really wanted to also add something that is important. Decades ago, when people came forward and said they wanted to do some positive things, we found it really hard to find any kind of a champion in the governmental apparatus. The bureaucracy is a silo in many ways, and the folks don't really work with us so well. So there was just a big conference of the United States Environmental Protection Agency in Detroit, Michigan, in which they talked about billions of dollars that have now come forward through the Inflation Reduction Act. And that Brownfields Conference is something that we've known about, but apparently we didn't send anybody from Santa Rosa. Luckily, I was able to talk with some folks out there about the successful effort that Sonoma County did five to six years ago to get $392,000 to do phase one assessments on Roberts Road, which is now in Santa Rosa. It's now part of your downtown, actually, the way that you've done things. And guess what? According to the state's Department of Toxic Substance Control, the geo tracker list has Sebastopol Road as an area that's eligible for these types of funds. So I'm hoping that you folks will step up now in the future, maybe collaborate with the county and see about getting some of those federal funds to really help keep the things that we need in the Roseland Census District on Sebastopol Road, which is the most disadvantaged, underserved, and overburdened in the entire county. Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment will be from Cynthia. Hello everybody, my name is Cynthia and I'm here because it's a coincidence that yesterday was the deadline to turn in my renewal for my short term rentals. I've been at this for hours trying to submit my application today, actually I started yesterday. There's a glitch in the system and today I came in to personally provide the paperwork because I've been locked out of the system. 
and nobody has taken my paperwork because the city council has an ordinance. So I'm just here to please ask for forgiveness. I need to submit my paperwork, but since the computer has been down, I wouldn't have a chance to do it yesterday. I walked into the planning division today, but I couldn't get them to get it proof of me even applying for it because since there's a glitch, there is no evidence that I was on the computer. Well, how am I supposed to prove that? So I walked over to the city manager's office and they suggested I come here and speak to you. I don't, I'm desperate, I don't know what to do. I have my paperwork, my family depends on this. I don't know, <laughs> that's it. I've been trying to submit it and Nobody has taken my paperwork today. Do you have a solution for me? We'll have one of our city staffs assist you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I see no one else in council chamber approaching the podiums for public comment, and I see no hands being raised via Zoom. We will now close public comment, moving to item 14.1, Madam City Manager. Item 14.1 is a report, investment policy update. Uh, if the staff could introduce themselves for the record, thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. Sorry, my name is Veronica Connor. I'm the budget manager, and I'm here today with Monique Spike, the managing director at PFM Asset Management. And we are presenting to you today an investment policy update. So a little background on our investment policy. It was first um, adopted by the city of Santa Rosa back in 1985. Since then, it's been back to council about 15 times, um, the most recent time being April of 2013. In May of this year, the finance department met with PFM and we went over some proposed changes to update and enhance the policy. The finance department has met with the major stakeholders here at the city, including the Parks and Rec Department, the Water Department, and the Housing Authority, and we have all consulted and reviewed the changes and asked any questions that were needed. And in conclusion, um, while the current policy is comprehensive and in compliance with the California Government Code, we are recommending these proposed changes. And I'm going to turn it over to Monique, who's going to go over these changes with you in detail. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, we thought it would be useful to start with some context uh, for the investment universe. Same as our chart not showing up. I'm sorry, there's a chart on this presentation that doesn't look like it's showing up. Um, Okay, well then we will, we will talk through it. Okay. Um, so if you go back a slide, we'll just look at the, the empty and I'll try to paint a picture for you. Um, the California Government Code is the code that governs uh, the ability of California public agencies like the city to invest um, in a number of different instruments. Um, 53601 is the code section specifically that governs investment opportunities for operating funds and operating reserves. Now the broader investment universe includes sort of three main or, or broad categories. Um, conventional fixed income, which I would characterize as things like U.S. Treasury bonds, municipal bonds, federal agencies, and corporate notes. Uh, these are the things sort of we're used to seeing and I would categorize as high quality fixed income. Going out from that, you have the broader fixed income category. And this includes things like high yield bonds, private placements, convertibles. Um, those types of investments are not allowed for California public agencies. 
Um, the equity category as well, things that you're used to seeing in your uh, 403B plans or 401Ks, also not, about, not allowed for these types of funds. And then the last category is the alternatives category, things like hedge funds, private equities, um, not allowed for California local agencies. So the investment universe that we're really restricted to is that conventional fixed income, that high quality fixed income. Furthermore, the California government code also places a maturity restriction. For the most part, California local agencies are not required to invest beyond five years without explicit approval from their governing bodies. Now I say that to say that we're working in a universe that's already very, very conservative. Um, I contrast uh, this government code restriction to a state like Florida, for example, which allows public agencies to invest in equities and commodities. So again, in California, we're really restricted to high quality fixed income securities. Um, now moving forward um, to the next slide, thank you, Veronica. Um, to the next slide. I want to talk about <clears throat> how the city's investment policy um, compares to what's allowed uh, by the California government code. Now we look at sort of three main categories, overnight investment vehicles, which are permitted by the code and by the city's current policy. Um, government obligations, um, and this includes things like U.S. Treasuries, federal agencies, um, municipal bonds, and supranational obligations, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Now the city's 2013 uh, policy does allow for municipal obligations, uh, but it does not allow for supras. Um, so we have some recommendations recommendations for those two categories, which I will go into detail. Um, in the credit category, uh, we are making recommendations uh, for expansion of the use of commercial paper, and we are also recommending um, the ability to invest in another category of investment, which are asset-backed securities, which are currently not permitted by the city's policy. Now our goal uh, for these recommendations is to expand uh, the universe of investments uh, that the city is utilizing in its portfolio uh, to provide more diversification opportunities in the portfolio and also in some instances to help with enhancing income um, and raising the credit quality of the portfolio as well. Um, with that said, I will go specifically into the proposed changes to the policy. Um, section by section, um, we wanted to make some changes to the policy that were also consistent with recent changes to the California Government Code. Um, in section six of the policy, the introductory paragraphs, um, we provided a recommendation to modify language that clarified that the settlement date um, of a security uh, cannot be 45 days from the time that the investment is purchased. Now this is a clarification in a code. Um, in some instances when you purchase a security, let's say the trade date, uh, the settlement date of that security may not be for a few days. And so that's called a forward settlement. Uh, this language in the code simply capped the time between trade and settlement at 45 days. Moving forward, um, the recommendation we made in terms of expanding the investment opportunity set um, was we recommended adding language to lower the minimum credit quality on municipal obligations from the double A category to the single A category. Um, now the California government code in your policy limits your ability to invest in municipal obligations to those that are issued by California municipalities. And if you are investing in a municipal out of the state of California, you have to purchase a state level municipal obligation. Now 91% of the municipal bond market is rated in the A category and above. Uh, we believe um, moving this uh, rating category down a step 
will allow us to access uh, some additional issuers um, without necessarily impacting the credit quality of the portfolio. And what I mean by that is at PFM Asset Management, we have a very strict credit review process. Um, we consider sort of the broader ratings that are assigned by Moody's and S&P to be filter criteria, where we ourselves go in on the back end do, and do independent credit analysis on each investment we purchase on the city's behalf. And we have a separate municipal credit group that researches and recommends issuers to us. So this rating change will allow us to open our filter for more opportunity, but the credit process that is already overlaid on your portfolio is consistent and has not changed. The next proposed change to the policy uh, was increasing the maximum limit for commercial paper from 25% to 40%. Um, now what's notable about uh, this change is that this was a recent change in the California Government Code in 2021. Now prior to 2021, counties in the state of California and the city and county, which is San Francisco, um, were allowed to uh, purchase 40% of their portfolios in commercial paper. Um, they are seen to be larger um, agencies who need more um, opportunities to find securities, and so that's why they had the broader authority. So this um, code was modified to allow other large public agencies, those with assets of 100 million or more, to have the same capabilities. And the city of Santa Rosa's portfolio, as you know, is, is certainly large enough to meet that threshold. And this gives us um, some additional investment flexibility by increasing this range by 15%. Um, the next category of investments is uh, supranationals. Now, if you're not familiar with supranational obligations, I'll define them briefly. Uh, they are simply international institutions or international corporations that were formed uh, via consensus or mutual agreement of multiple countries. Um, there are three supranational organizations allowed for California issuers, and that includes the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, um, also known as the World Bank, um, the International Finance Corporation, and the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, these three specific organizations are allowed for California public agencies uh, because they are AAA rated, uh, they are headquartered in the United States, and the code also uh, restricts our ability to purchase these types of agencies to U.S. dollar-denominated securities. Um, we believe this is a great category to have um, in your policy. It is uh, the government sector currently that is AAA rated across the board. It allows for us to have more diversification in the government segment of the portfolio. Um, and although the code does not have an issuer limit, uh, the policy language that was recommended includes a 10% per issuer limit in this category. Um, the next uh, proposed change to the policy that we are recommending is also to increase our investment opportunity set, and it is to add asset-backed securities, which is a type of corporate security. Now, asset-backed securities um, are unique in that they are securities that are actually backed by a pool of assets. Uh, the policy language uh, that we're recommending uh, limits these types of assets to uh, equipment-backed leases for example, or consumer receivables such as auto loans. Um, we are also uh, recommending a, a maximum issuer limit of 5% in this category, and the sector limit uh, suggested is 20%. Um, now, asset-backed securities have been allowed for public agencies for um, many decades um, in California. Uh, we also have a separate uh, credit committee for asset-backed securities that reviews uh, the underwriting standards for the assets that back the securities themselves, uh, reviews the programs, and we limit ourselves to those programs that are rated uh, AAA, which is also uh, a requirement that we put in the city's investment policy. 
Um, moving forward to our um, recommended changes, this next change was also consistent with a uh, government code change that was enacted this year. Um, and this change is simply a clarification uh, to the code that confirmed that when calculating the maximum maturity on a security, you utilize the settlement date of that security and the final maturity date. And so we added language to match that. Um, the next change to the investment policy was simply to add uh, language from the city's uh, standing resolution which prohibited investments in the fossil fuel industry. Um, we recommended um, clarifying how those uh, restrictions would be uh, confirmed and complied with. Um, so confirming that the fossil fuel restriction uh, would include uh, companies engaged in energy services, oil and gas producers, um, and also refiners and pipelines. Um, we also clarified the methodology that is used to confirm that um, and utilizing the uh, ratings and product placement from Sustainalytics, which is a partner, and that is a company that is a subsidiary of Morningstar, which focuses on the sustainability of over 16,000 companies. Um, the last proposed changes um, that we recommended are also sort of clarification changes. Uh, we added a section on collateralization, uh, which described the security types which require collateralization, and that includes uh, time certificates of deposit and repurchase agreements. Um, and lastly, we also added a section in the policy which describes the policy review procedure. Thank you, Monique. So that concludes the detail of all of our proposed changes. And in conclusion, where the finance department is recommending that council adopt the update to the investment policy, uh, which includes the authorized and suitable investment and the investment parameter sections, as well as adding the collateralization and investment policy adoption section. And with that, Monique and I are both here to answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Looking to council to see if there are any questions. Councilmember Rogers. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I had a question really, and I think it might fall under the asset backed securities section, uh, and correct me if it doesn't, but I'm really curious on how our investment portfolio aligns with the city's overall goals, and in particular, certain things like housing or energy. Is there room in the investment portfolio for the city to invest in housing projects in Santa Rosa, for instance, that perhaps uh, we've talked before about a revolving fund uh, to help get projects actually built with a guaranteed rate of return back to the city or an investment in one of Sonoma Clean Power's geothermal plants that they're working to, to build, for instance. And I know that there was a, a program out of Sacramento that we talked about back in 2018, I think it was, maybe it was 2017, that really looked at how municipalities could use their investment for portfolio to sort of hypercharge or supercharge particularly around housing. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, question, Council Member Rogers. Um, unfortunately, the California Government Code does not leave a lot of flexibility to invest in locally financed projects. Um, and the reason for that is just the way the California Government Code describes and enumerates the allowable investments for California local agencies for these types of funds specifically. And so what we do is we find ourselves uh, challenged a bit when it comes to uh, being able to participate in local financing uh, for housing programs, et cetera. Um, on a broader basis, we do participate in many uh, commercial mortgage-backed programs, which are often multifamily housing, but that tends to sort of stretch across the country and is not very localized. Um, we continue to engage with um, our banking partners at US Bank and other places to continue to think about ways to bring ideas to our client partners, but it's really hard with this particular portfolio to engage um, in opportunities like that just because of the code restrictions. Yeah, and I think if I remember correctly, I think the program that we were sort of looking at was a pilot program that liquidated uh, CDs primarily mm -hmm. and then partnered with local banks, particularly yep. your, your local, hyper-local mm -hmm. banks, to create a program where essentially they would 
administer the money in exchange for having specific parameters set up on who they could lend that money to. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen any of that. I don't know if that program still is around or that, mm -hmm. that uh, pilot program was, but I would be interested in either hearing more eventually about how we can invest in particularly housing with our investment strategies or what state uh, changes we would need to start talking with our state partners and our representatives about. Thank you. Seeing no additional questions or comments, I'm going to ask uh, Mm -mm. Madam City Clerk to facilitate public comment. Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 14.1. If you are in council chamber and would like to comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please dial star nine or raise your hand. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approaching the podiums in council chamber. I see no hands being raised via Zoom, and we had no advanced public comments. Thank you. Council Member Fleming, can you please make a motion? Indeed. I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Council Policy 000-26, Statement of Investment Policy, and wait further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion made by Council Member Fleming and a second by Vice Mayor McDonald. Are there any additional questions or comments? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Council Member Stepp? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Council, whoops. <laughs> Excuse me, Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show that passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you. Um, and right now, we will skip the rest of the items on 14 and come back to them, but we are going to go to our first public hearing, which is 15.1. Madam City Manager? Item 15.1 is a public hearing, placement of annual stormwater enterprise charges on the Sonoma County property tax roll, manner of collection. There we go. All right, good evening, Mayor Rogers and council members. Uh, I am pleased to be here today to discuss the placement of the annual stormwater enterprise charges on the Sonoma County property tax roll. The stormwater enterprise was created by council in accordance with Title 16 of the city code in 1996. Uh, it provides funding for implementation of the city's National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, stormwater permit, uh, as well as activities such as creek restoration and stewardship, flood protection, um, public education, storm drain maintenance, and stormwater quality testing. The calculated assessment is based on equivalent residential unit, or ERU, uh, which considers the size of the parcel, the amount of impervious surface, and the land use of each parcel. The current ERU fee is $39.98, which was approved by council during the 2023-2024 budget process. In order to simplify the payment process for property owners and to minimize collection expenses for the city, uh, it is requested that these charges be collected on the Sonoma County property tax roll on the city's behalf. The charges have been collected uh, annually on the tax roll since they were established in September of 1996. 
it is in the best interest of the city that these that those parcels not build uh, by the county due to the charges not meeting the county's ten dollar minimum to bill and or parcels with known incorrect ownership contact information uh, shall not be separately billed by the city as the cost of separately billing exceeds the potential revenue any charges not collected will not affect other parcel charges Today's public hearing in accordance with Title 16 of the City Code will adopt the Stormwater Enterprise Charge Report, uh, approve placing the charges on the county tax roll for collection, and allow the public the opportunity to protest the method of collecting the charges. It is recommended by Santa Rosa Water that the Council, by resolution, adopt by two-thirds vote the Stormwater Enterprise Charge Report and approve placement of the Stormwater Enterprise Charges on the Sonoma County Property Tax Roll to be collected by the Sonoma County Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector at the same time and in the same manner as Sonoma County property taxes are collected unless those charges do not meet the county's minimum of $10 and or parcel owner contact information is known to be incorrect. With that, oh, go ahead, I'm welcome. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. Council, are there any questions? Seeing none, I will now open the public hearing. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 15.1. If you are in council chamber and would like to comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mayor, I see no one approaching the podiums for public comment and no hands in Zoom being raised. Thank you, we will now close close the public hearing and I'll bring it back to council to see if there are any questions, seeing none. Uh, council member Stapp, can you please make a motion? Thank you, Mayor. I move that the council of the city of Santa Rosa approve and adopt the report for proposal to place stormwater and drainage charges on Sonoma County property tax roll for collection with county property taxes uh, for the fiscal year 2023-2024. And wait for the reading of the text. Second. I have a motion made by Council Member Stapp and a second by Vice Mayor McDonald. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Stapp? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Aye. Council Member Okrepke? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show that passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you. Um, council will now take a short dinner break and we will return at 6.30.
Madam City Clerk, Santa Quorum, may you please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Stapp? Here. Councilmember Rogers? Here. Councilmember Okrepke? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Councilmember Alvarez? Vice Mayor McDonald? I'm here. Mayor Rogers. Present. Let the record show all council members are present with the exception of council member Alvarez. We're gonna continue um, and we're gonna go to item 14.2, Madam City Manager. Okay, as the theme music plays for item 14.2, <laughs> we have a report. It's a grant application to the Federal Emergency <coughs> Management Agency, staffing for adequate fire and emergency response grant, safer for funding for the hiring of 12 firefighters for high demand service areas. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers, members of council. Scott Westrow, Fire Chief for the City of Santa Rosa. Um, today, we bring to you a request for application for a FEMA SAFER grant. Um, and as City Manager outlined, SAFER is the staffing for adequate fire emergency response. Normally, we'd bring something like this to you under consent, but uh, due to the potential for um, long-term financial implications, we felt it best to be a little bit more detailed in this report. So just some uh, quick background on the department and on uh, SAFER itself. In 2019, some of you recall uh, ESCI, which is Emergency Services Consulting International, uh, conducted a staffing needs assessment for Santa Rosa Fire. Uh, they found that Santa Rosa Fire Department did not meet NFPA 1710 for full assembly at Structure Fire 61% of the time. I'll define NFPA 1710 and, um, and call out why we weren't, weren't uh, meeting those times uh, later on in the presentation. Our call volume has significantly increased over the past three years. Um, in 2000, in calendar year 22, we ran almost 30,000 calls for a year, a year for service. Uh, 240 of those were structure fires, and we typically run right around 60% emergency medical service calls. Uh, we have a current strategic plan of deployment analysis that recommend uh, the need for additional resources. And really on the, on the SAFER side, we have successfully managed and implemented three previous SAFER grants in 2006, where we hired three firefighters uh, to bring staffing to Engine 10 on the southwest side. Um, we hired nine firefighters uh, in 2012 for staffing of Engine 10 and 11. In 2013, we hired three firefighters uh, for Station 6. So SAFER grant guidelines. Um, the SAFER grant is essentially funding available for hiring firefighters for a three-year period of performance. This is based off NFPA 17's 10 structural response standards, which I'll get into here in a moment. And there is no cost share match during the period of performance. So what we find our, ourselves in is a, a situation where we're trying to solve two concurrent problems at the same time. Um, NFPA 1710 is what SAFER relies on for staffing, and I'll describe it here um, in detail in a moment. So we're worried about 1710, and that has to deal with structure fires. We also have a problem, which I'll get into in the next slide, with our day-to-day -day response time. So for our EMS calls, car crashes, lift assists, hazardous material responses, what we do on a majority on the on the day-to-day, -day, we're also seeing a decline in our compliance with response times there. So we're trying to fix both those problems at the same time with federal funding tied to 1710. So 1710 looks at three areas of focus. It's the uh, arrival of the initial engine assigned to the event within four minutes, 90% of the time. It's arrival of a full complement of firefighting resources. For us, that's 17 people, uh, eight minutes, 90% of the time. And to call one thing out here, where we saw the major decrease in 2019 is the minimum personnel in the full complement changed from 14 to 17. And our first alarm assignment is 14 people. So we were very good until they changed the number and increased the number. I was waiting to say next slide, please. I forgot it was me. 
um, response time compliance. So just on the day-to-day -day basis, um, the last time we added a resource or added a station engine company was 2009. So if we look at 2010, one year after um, in inception of engine 11, we were running just around 9,500 calls for service. And we were meeting our city council goal response times 76.87% of the time. In 2022, like we just talked about, we ran just shy of 30,000 calls a year for service and our response times are down compliance-wise to just under 60%. And just to remind you all, City Council goals response time standards is five minutes for turnout and travel time 90% of the time. So you see there's a minute variance in there between NFPA and Council, and actually it's, it's false. It's the same because NFPA does not count turnout time. They just count response time. So we give a minute for turnout time and four minutes for response time. So your goal Goals are the same as NFPA 1710s, they're just calculated a little bit differently. So in order to address these collateral problems of NFPA 1710 um, response time standards and our response times goal on a day-to-day -day basis, our team got really creative in what we're going to look at here. So our request is to the federal government is a $7.08 million grant over three years, equating to $2.3 million per year. This will fund the hiring of 12 new firefighter paramedics, and these new firefighters will staff two advanced life support squads. I'm gonna take a pause here real quick to explain what a squad is. Um, for those of you who have been around for a while, um, the show Emergency in the 70s, that's why I'm here. Um, followed squad 51 you know it's a, it's a it's a smaller vehicle so they're on a on a truck based chassis um, really quick to respond two person and so they can get to areas quicker get to small areas quicker and they're and they're very um, flexible in what their their mission can be now we may not have something that looks exactly like that but the squads will be a two person resource um, that will be a small light vehicle they will not be on a fire engine if we get this grant tomorrow quite honestly they may be in one of our current fleet suvs or pickup trucks um, eventually we have some different plans on what we can put them in but it's not a fire engine it is a quick response vehicle um, so to speak so the, the squads will respond to EMS calls for service focused on our busiest fire districts, particularly District 1 downtown and District 11 up by the JC, but they'll move around as our data dictates. And they'll also respond to structure fires as part of that NFPA 1710 um, compliance model. In the off-peak hours, so typically we look at peak probably 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. In the off-peak hours, those squad personnel will be disseminated to four different outlying stations to be the fourth person on an engine company. So that really helps us with the NFPA response time standards. So. They're essentially going to be working a split shift. They'll be working half of it on the squad, running calls downtown and, and in, the, in the major core areas. And then at night, they'll be going to engine companies. And the main reason for this is we don't have a place to house two squads. We don't have sleeping facilities and office facilities for um, two additional resources on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's where the team got really creative. Um, I really compliment them for, for how they got through this and, uh, and found a creative solution to the problem. So what we're really here to talk about is not necessarily the tactical implementation, but really what happens at the end of the grant award. So when the period of performance ends, there's gonna be a lot of different, you know, variances on what we can look at doing with these people, but sort of at a high level, the three major areas that we can consider are continue to fund the 12 FTEs and continue to keep the squads in service out of the general fund. Um, we can identify an alternative funding source to keep the squads in service or utilize the employees in a different capacity. Uh, the landscape could really change between now and then with some of the things that we have um, in the pipeline right now with the Frowls contract and with a potential sales tax measure. So there's a lot of different ways we may be able to use these employees in three years. Worst case scenario in which we've done in the past is we would absorb these employees by attrition into the current workforce through retirements, injury retirements, things like that. So, so really there's not a whole lot of risk because at the end of the day when we assess the effectiveness of the squads, we assess where we're at financially as a city, um, assess where we're at as a fire department and our strategic plans moving forward we have options and, and the worst option is we absorb the employees and we do not do we don't we don't lamb off or anything like that so with that the recommendation is uh, the fire department to the recommendation by the fire department that the council by resolution authorize staff to submit a grant application to FEMA for safer in total in the total amount of seven point zero eight four 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 zero dollars for hiring of twelve firefighters for response in high demand areas. Two, 
authorize the fire chief or designee to accept the grant award and approve and execute all documents and agreements related to the grant, subject to approval as to the form by the city attorney, and three, authorize the CFO to appropriate funds into the project account by the amount of the grant award. And with that, that is the end of my presentation. I'll turn it over to you for any questions you may have. Thank you, Chief, for that presentation. Looking to council to see if there are any questions or comments. Council Member Okrepke. Yeah, just one quick clarifying question. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll walk this tightrope as, as easily as I can. From a strictly informational standpoint, one of those things you have in the hopper uh, or that is in the hopper is that sales tax measure, which is meant to enhance but not replace funding. Should we approve this funding now if this grant, or if this, would, would this grant disqualify us, or would, how do I say this? Would this grant not allow us, since it would be an internal funding, would it not allow us to use tax me possible tax measure funding for it going forward? No, I understand. I understand the question and where you're going with it, and, and I think that's where I was really trying to lean into um, the fact that it's, there's going to be some reflex time with the potential sales tax measure if it does pass. Um, we wouldn't see the funds until fourth quarter 24, first quarter of 25, and then we have to hire additional people. We have to build fire stations. We buy, got to buy the equipment, things like that. So there's going to be some time in there, and there's enough flexibility written into the ordinance language of the potential sales tax measure that we could still use those funds to. Um, um, hire the personnel and keep them um, in employment. So I don't think there's going to be an issue, and I think the timing could be um, very good. I was trying to think of a fancy word, and I couldn't come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> Any additional questions from council? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment. Thank you. We are now taking public on item 14.2. If you're in the council chamber and would like to provide comment but have not provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. And again, this is for item 14.2, the grant application. I see no one approaching the podium in council chamber. I'm gonna turn it over to our Zoom host to facilitate Zoom public comments. Thank you. Um, first up is Adina, and after that will be Shelby. Just want to confirm that this is for item report item 14.2. So Adina, I'm allowing your permissions to talk. Uh, good evening, uh, Council. I believe uh, this is the item regarding the fire grants, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, so to speak to this further, I believe that previously Mr. Okrepke was the founder of Coffee Strong along with Mr. Steve Rom, uh, Sonoma County Supervisor Gore's brother-in-law. There's been a lot of inquiries uh, surrounding the allocation of the funding with the fire grants. For example, uh, Supervisor Gore's wife previously lobbied $2 million for PG&E with the fire victim money instead of giving that money to the fire victims, which is illegal as a 501c3. I've noticed uh, similar patterns with uh, Coffee Strong. And so I, as an investigative journalist for the California Globe, I'm currently covering the story regarding the Hawaii fires and they are completely illegitimate. This was definitely planned by our government, which I can tangibly prove through the financials and associated in matters. Um, so I, I hope that's not the case within Santa Rosa. However, I was the executive assistant to the Fountain Grove Country Club when it burned down. It was the largest fire claim within the entire area. And uh, as somebody who was the executive assistant, I get to hear the dirty laundry aired of some of our richest um, individuals in the community. And so it seems like a great way to fabricate disasters that we are profiting off of uh, while as a genuine member of this community, I want to believe that's not true. Um, for example, with the Tubbs fire, the fire map, the way that it jumped was absolutely insane and uh, it's a bit ridiculous. So I would love as somebody who is involved uh, and labeled now by the media as the largest activist in the entire county for us to have some kind of citizen action group so we can, uh, at least if we're not auditing every single contract going to council for approval, I'd like to do spot checks. I think that's absolutely necessary. 
Uh, I haven't had enough time to fully dig into Santa Rosa Council as my focus is more at the county level. Um, but the misappropriation of funds as a former government employee who's currently in settlement with my employer, um, former employer, it, it's really concerning. And I'm concerned for our constituents because our taxpayers work hard and there is zero transparency in this county. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Next up is Shelby. Shelby, please go ahead when you're ready. Hello, good evening, Barb. Good evening. Um, I just want to follow up on uh, Ms. Flores' comment. Mr. Jeff O'Creepy, you uh, literally are the individual who, out of your mouth during this presentation, your questions were about grant funding and how this would affect uh, individuals. I'm sure you're very interested in that because you like taking money from the constituents anyway. I'm really concerned that the data that's being pulled uh, on your projects and the things that you have your hands in, it's very interesting to me that, Mr. O'Creepy, you have a uh, very big uh, interest in this taxation, which, you know, that taxation is BS. We already pay taxes, then we got to pay taxes on top of taxes, and it's not you rich people paying for it, sir. It's us, the hardworking individuals who do this every day. Why don't you come up out of your pocket with the nonprofit that you've been stealing money from to help fund some of this instead of ask us to come out of our pockets while you nickel and dime us to, you know, poverty? This doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Your interest... Shelby, uh, can we focus on the item, please? You're not allowed to... Rob me while I'm discussing uh, anything that is related to this, and this is very related to this, as a Brown Act violation. I'll get your name, don't worry. This public record is very public, and I can uh, pull the transcripts, and I'll be sure that the individuals who need to take care of you and set you straight will. Um, this comes down to the fact that, basically, these grant funds, the taxation that you individuals are interested in, Mr. O'Creepy, like I was saying, ma'am, um, basically can be proven that none of the funds that went to, to any of the fire victims to begin with, and this gentleman is sitting up on the board asking about tax money and money to begin with. He's the last person on earth I think should be asking any of that. So I'll leave it short and sweet. You're gonna be under investigation, bruh. Get used to that. Cause it, we're gonna be here for a long time. Our activism is out here and we'll have you in articles after articles after articles and we will get the transparency whether you like it or not and hopefully like i told your brothers mr gore just earlier i hope you guys all end up like martha stewart but no snoop dog at the end all right brother have a good day thank you we have no additional hands raised via zoom <clears throat> and no pre-recorded messages for this item Thank you. Council Member Okrepke, can you please make a motion? Happily. Uh, <clears throat> I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa authorizing the submittal of a grant application to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, for funding of hiring 12 firefighters in the amount of $7,084,440.00 authorizing the fire chief or designee to accept the grant award, approve and execute all documents and agreement r related to the grant and authorizing the chief financial officer to appropriate the funds and waiver for the reading of the text. Second. I have a motion made by Councilmember Krepke and a second made by Councilmember Stapp. Are there any questions from Council, comments? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Councilmember Stapp? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record, excuse me, let the record show that passes with six affirmative votes with Council, or Vice Mayor McDonald absent from the dais. Moving on to item 14.3, Madam City Manager. Item 14.3 is a report 
fiscal year 2023-2024 budget amendment, increase appropriations to construct a modern irrigation supply system for the Bennett Valley Golf Course and delegate authority for issuance of a design build request for proposals to design and construct the Bennett Valley Golf Course Irrigation Supply System Project. I'm sorry, Jen, you don't have any theme music, so. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor McDonald, Council Members. I'm Jen Santos, the Acting Director for Recreation and Parks Department. And thanks for that. I'm going to get this soon, hopefully, and figure this out myself. But uh, tonight we're going to discuss the request to uh, for a budget amendment to increase appropriations for Bennett Valley Golf Course in the amount of $2 million to construct a modern irrigation system. And two, I will say from the wisdom of our capital projects team, a recommendation to request the option to utilize the design build method uh, to um, select that if we choose uh, as a saving um, a step should the determination uh, to use design build be in the best interest of the city. So I always start with this slide when we're talking about Bennett Valley Golf Course, but I just like to set us up for those of us who haven't seen it as well. On the left, you'll see an aerial view of the golf course. And uh, we have in red the uh, on the southern part or the lower part of the slide, the restaurant, um, pro shop, parking area. And then at the top, we have the maintenance areas and everything else in between is, is golf course as well as our driving range and on the right you can see a graphic image of that um, representing the golf course area we have um, it's an 18 hole golf course of course with um, uh, a driving range restaurant pro shop and um, on the right one you can see Matanzas Creek going through it a little bit better than you can on the aerial And so as I mentioned, we have 150 acres, 18 hole, par 72, 650, 500 acre yard golf course with an unlit driving range is very popular. We have a, one of the reasons we're here tonight is that we have been talking for the last year and a half about the irrigation system and the infrastructure needs at the golf course and the critical nature they're at being over 50 years old at this point. Um, Last year, we saw a presentation from the National Golf Foundation who did an um, analysis of the condition of the golf course and facilities surrounding the golf course, and they strongly recommended that the council consider uh, funding these critical infrastructure needs at the golf course, which especially the irrigation system has not been updated for over 50 years, and it's really in critical condition. So. Um, also, National Golf Foundation also emphasized the need <clears throat> uh, for investment in our critical infrastructure as a means to um, uh, getting a better investment for the community as well as potential revenue growth at the golf course. So those are really key items they mentioned to the council on ways that they, we could improve the golf course and keep it sustained for the next 50 years. So the golf course primarily relies on uh, rainwater during the winter months, spring through fall, and relies on well water um, in spring through summer, and usually takes about eight to 10 hours of irrigation at night to water the golf course, depending on the weather. If it's, if it's a little bit uh, cooler out, we, we don't need that much hours. If it's a little hotter, it will go up to 10 hours potentially. Um, so when the council approved Touchstone's uh, management agreement last June, we did discuss then at that time uh, the recognition of the need to return to discuss infrastructure needs, critical infrastructure needs. And we did talk briefly about the, or maybe extensively about the irrigation system, the drainage systems, and a lot of other infrastructure needs at the golf course itself. So uh, one thing that National Golf Foundation recognized was that the irrigation system is the 
critical need is, you know, providing water to the golf course is the life force of that golf course. And without water, we really don't have a golf course. So we, in order to move forward with an irrigation system, we're really looking at um, that water storage system, that supply system to the existing irrigation system, new pumps, et cetera, to get that started. Um, and the process we're choosing is to uh, produce and request for proposals for a consultant design to design and construct it. We're also looking at potentially um, authorizing this city manager to allow for us to look at the design build options as a time saving step. Because we are, you know, we are wanting to move this project forward quickly so that we can really get these critical infra infrastructure projects rolling. Um, Touchstone, uh, while we'll, the city will be bidding the project, Touchstone will remain as our um, advisor and provide information to us. They are our experts on the golf course and they have reconstructed uh, many things on their other golf courses and they're very familiar with this irrigation system. It would be a great uh, service to the city to have their um, services through this process. That's supposed to say simultaneously we will uh, be conducting an environmental analysis on this uh, irrigation supply system and uh, uh, have an environmental dec declaration at the same time. Uh, once we're moving forward with the uh, proposal, we'll be coming back to council. So tonight we're looking at um, the request for a budget amendment as well as the authorization to use design build if we choose. Um, but we'll be coming back. When it is a project, we'll be coming back for that authorization from council to approve that plan. And when we do that, we'll be conducting a huge outreach plan to work with our golfing community as well as our neighbors and community stakeholders to talk about the construction of the upcoming project and make sure we've heard from our community. At that point, we'll also be putting out a schedule um, so that everyone can see what is planned. Uh, we'll keep the golf course um, operational during the whole construction project. Uh, there may be some holes that are off, but you can, um, I'm hearing from Touchstone, you can uh, hit those same holes twice or they have methods for um, making sure the golfers can have an 18 round of golf even while construction is ongoing. So the, um, Let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead so we can get get through this part. On the financial side, just a reminder, this is an enterprise fund, which means that we're expecting that the revenue raised um, at the golf course is funding its operations and maintenance going forward, as well as capital infrastructure. Um, as you've heard us several times before when we come before you, in the years prior, the golf course has not made enough funds to get us to a point where we have a um, capital fund reserve. We have reserves for operations and maintenance as required by the council policy, um, but we're not in a position where we have uh, funds available for large infrastructure, you know, critical infrastructure needs. Um, and so that's why we're here tonight to talk about, you know, the golf course is not gonna be in a, in a position to have the funds necessary to start this process uh, in the near future. And we'll be ne needing an investment here to keep this golf course operational. Um, I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again. It worth, it's worth mentioning National Golf Foundation did predicate their projections of pre, uh, future revenue based on the implementation of all high priority capital projects with, of course, the irrigation system being the number one priority. So in our original estimate, we were originally thinking of a cost estimate of $1 million, but as we have watched the bids come in for other projects and we have uh, done preliminary research for this, we, we realized this project is likely to cost closer to $2 million. So we're asking for $2 million from the unassigned general fund reserves for the ir irrigation system and environmental review. And so, like I mentioned before, I just want to mention again, we this is about the budget amendment tonight as well as the use of design build, and we will come back at a future date when we do have a project to present to you and go through that uh, contract uh, with you at that time. Uh, and for now, we it is recommended by the Recreation and Parks Department and Transportation and Public Works Departments that the council, by resolution, increase appropriations in the Bennett Valley Golf Course Operations Fund in the amount of $2 million from the unassigned general fund reserves for environmental review, design, and construction of a modern irrigation supply system at Bennett Valley Golf Course, and two, 
uh, delegate authority to the city manager or designee to determine whether a design build procurement is in the best interest of the city and to issue the design build request for proposal for the project. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions. I also want to mention that I do have representatives from Touchstone here if there are any detailed questions about um, Touchstone. So thanks. Thank you for that presentation and thank you all for being here in case we have any questions. Looking to council to see if there are any questions or comments. All right, seeing none, Madam City Clerk may you please facilitate public comment. Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comments on item 14.3. If you're in the council chamber and would like to comment but have not provided a speaker card, or your name, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. The first public comment will be from Richard. Thank you. My name is Richard Carlisle and I'm president of the Save Bennett Valley Golf Course Group. Uh, which I think you're all familiar with. Uh, we're about 4,000 strong that we're backing the support of the golf course. And um, I, I think, you know, this is just another step that was brought out to the, by the attention of the National Golf Foundation's report given to the council earlier on the need for this irrigation system. And uh, it's irrigation and storage. And I can tell you, I think it's a good idea to do a design build because these are very complex systems. They're spread out over a large area. And as a civil engineer, I can vouch for that. I was involved in the design and construction of four golf courses here locally. And it's very complex. So I think this is a good move. And having the flexibility with the city manager to adjust it as it moves forward is another good idea. So on behalf of the uh, Save Bennett Valley Golf Course, I recommend that you approve this and uh, move forward with the irrigation system. Thank you. Thank you, I see no additional public comments from Council Chamber. I'll turn it over to our Zoom host to facilitate Zoom public comments. Thank you, we will start with Shelby followed by Jim. Shelby, please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good evening again, Council. Um, you know, I wish there was a short way to explain this, but helping this golf course go ahead and take more water when we're looking at droughts, when we're looking at all this other stuff, and we have a homeless crisis in, in the midst of all this. My mom used to tell me as a young kid that I couldn't watch cartoons unless I did my chores first. Um, on Saturday morning. So I would do them Friday night. I guess what I'm trying to get from that little story is, is that you're not prioritizing things that are important and you're gonna go waste millions of dollars to let these white people play a stupid game where they hit this ball around. This doesn't make any damn sense. You need to not give them this money since they're 4,000 members strong and they all have the money in their pockets. Why don't they all collectively tip in and make it work. But instead they wanna take funds from the community where the community is lacking in areas that need to be improved before this nonsense gets approved. We can continue to play stupid games and win stupid prizes, or we can start using the money, not coming from funds, taking care of our chores first, and then you guys can have your cartoons. I don't think that this is rocket science. You think I'm just some ignorant little black dude who isn't that little, or you know, I don't have a perspective that you too much care to hear, but anybody with 4,000 members, do the math. If those people can afford to play golf, they can afford to help fund their passion. The rest of us have to do this. If we want something bad enough, we'll make it happen and we don't necessarily get the grant funding or the, the, the monies from the city or any of that. So 
These white people can handle it. They got money. Let them pay. Let them figure it out. Put the, that money in the right place. Don't give it to people who are going to waste money to hit some stupid ass little ball back and forth all over the place for 18 holes. That's nonsense. Thank you. Thanks, it will be Jim, followed by Adina. Jim, please go ahead when you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, my name is James Girk. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa since uh, 2012. I've been an annual member of the golf course since 2013. And I'm presently on the Bennett Valley Advisory Committee. You know, I think that the gentleman before, he makes some good points, but I would say that, you know, you have to be somewhat visionary about the whole idea of recreation. The golf course in Galvin Park, they, these are, are like gems. That any city in, the, in California would be envious of the fact that we've had these around for over 54 years. So in Touchstone, I believe that you've got really an outstanding administrator of the golf course operating more than 20 courses across the state, including the public Tilden Park in Berkeley and Presidio in San Francisco. I'm also a member of a number of, of uh, clubs that play at the golf course. And while the number 4,000 that was turned out, that's just a fraction of the number of people that actually use the golf course. And the numbers could be easily generated by Touchstone about how many rounds they sell every year. I played with some gentlemen from San uh, Rafael last week, and they marveled at what a great deal it was and what a wonderful course. Going back to the previous gentleman's comment, last week I played with a gentleman who's an immigrant from Ethiopia. The week before that, I played with an immigrant citizen here who was from Korea, both business people who are annual members of the golf course. So there is diversity, there's youth, there's a women's league. I mean, this is a gem of Santa Rosa. I hate to bring up the fact that you've probably heard it a million times before, but were it not for the fact that a previous city councils, you know, unloaded a lot of debt on the golf course in order to build the clubhouse and the restaurant. Had it not been for that, you wouldn't be faced with the issue of an appropriation. But I highly urge you to vote yes on the staff's recommendation for the $2 million and 54 more years of Bennett Valley and Galvin Park as a recreational gem to Santa Rosa. Thank you. Next up will be Adina, followed by Sheila. Adina, please go ahead when you're ready. Good evening, Council. I would like to echo the sentiments expressed by Mr. Pryor. Uh, there is definitely a socioeconomic difference between the county of Sonoma and the county of Solano, specifically the city of Vallejo, I reside in currently. That being said, when we are looking at available funding overall and prioritizing, a golf course is not a necessity. And when I speak about prioritizing, for example, in Vallejo, California, we're not worried about golf courses. We have prostitutes walking around in broad daylight. So those are the priorities we're discussing. And when I go over to Roseland, where all of my friends reside, I'm somebody who grew up playing competitive soccer on fields that are torn apart. That hasn't changed since I was a child. Mr. Alvarez is doing amazing things and we are so lucky to have him, but he is one person and political processes take time. I heard uh, during comments earlier today on the consent calendar uh, statements regarding the homeless issue. As an investigative journalist, I cover homelessness across the state of California. It, it is increasing exponentially. People are actually being shuttled into the county because the encampments are growing rapidly. So when we are trying to figure out where the funding needs to lie, we should be prioritizing the best interests of the people. And that, of course, I'd love to fulfill the needs of recreational activities. 
but somebody's livelihood should always come first. There are people who can't put food on the table. There are people that don't have a roof over their head. And I can't personally imagine what that's like. And I pray for those people and I, you know, I, I am humbled by the conditions that they face. So I appreciate the gentleman that spoke before me and the manner in which he addressed Mr. Pryor's comments. Uh, he was very kind. I would like to say that much. Um, so I'm hoping that we could come to some kind of resolution, but I think there needs to be better prioritization at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sheila. Sheila, please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Sheila Bell, and I've been involved with the Save Bennett Valley Golf Course Grassroots Support Program or group since February of 2021, and I've been a resident in Santa Rosa since 1977. I strongly encourage the city's approval to appropriate the $2 million from the unassigned general fund reserves for the environmental review, design, and construction of a modern irrigation supply system for the Bennett Valley Golf Course. Appropriation of the funds is the first critical step towards a full replacement of the aging, as was mentioned in the report, over 50 years irrigation system infrastructure. As was seen this past winter, the ability to handle flooding and water movement on the course is essential to maintaining this important enterprise park within our city. To clarify a bit to the community, the course has its own aquifer and this is not on the city's water system. So that's to be really looked at when you're talking about drought and water reserves. As we all know, the Bennett Valley Golf Course continues to be an important asset in our community that supports all walks of life, ethnicities and ages, including very valuable youth programs within our community very valuable and touchstone has done an outstanding job to date with the management of the course and supporting these youth programs uh, women's programs uh, retirement programs outreach into the community as well and that's despite the challenges they face when first assuming that position my hope is that the city will continue to provide meaningful support to Touchstone and our entire community by providing the funds needed to improve and maintain this very important asset within our community. Given that, it will continue also to be an important revenue generator within our community without the ability to take care of it and improve it and maintain it, that can't happen. Thank you for your consideration uh, on this very important area within our city. Thank you. Thank you. We have no additional public speakers on Zoom and no pre-recorded messages. Thank you. Council Member Stapp, can you please make a motion? Thank you, Mayor. I move that the that the City Council of Santa Rosa, let's see, make a fiscal year 2023-2024 budget amendment to increase appropriations to construct a modern irrigation storage system for the Bennett Valley Golf Course, BVGC, with the source of funds being the unassigned general fund reserves and delegation of authority to the city manager or a designee to determine whether a design build procurement is in the best interest of the city and to issue the design build request for a proposal for the project and waive the further reading of the text. Second. I have a motion made by council member Stapp and a second by council member Okrepke. Are there any additional questions or comments from council members? Council member Alvarez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Jen, thank you for the presentation. In, in regards to the irrigation of, of the golf course, I'm seeing the use of rainwater fall through spring. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on what that means? Are we waiting for the raindrops to fall in spring to water the grass? Yes, actually, it's really simple. So yeah, we just rely on uh, old-fashioned rainwater to water the course uh, through that uh, through the winter, uh, and sometimes spring we make that determination on when to start up the wells to help water the. And taking into consideration some of the callers and their their concerns, and having visited the the, the park itself, and thank you for the for the the stroll around the park on the on the summer day. 
Uh, could we consider the way that park sits right now a liability to the city of Santa Rosa and something that we're actively trying to resolve? Well, definitely we're looking at something that we, we really want to actively resolve. And I think you, you know, whether you want to call it a liability, um, it's in a critical nature. And for improvement. Right. It's, it's really critical. We've spent, um, you know, $40,000 every few years fixing pumps alone and little bits and pieces that break on this system. So really trying to make sure that we're looking at investing in our infrastructure is, in my mind, reducing the risk for failure of the golf course. Um, there is a high likelihood of failure if we have a significant failure of the uh, water supply system. So we're looking at updating that and modernizing it after 50 plus years. Yes, it definitely looks like something that would have been on on an airship during uh, the first landing of the moon. Uh, you know, it definitely looks like they might have dropped it off on the way back, right? Uh, what I really want the, the, the community to understand is that that this is a gem of the city of Santa Rosa. And I know there's been history that hasn't been always bright for the investment there at the golf course. But one thing that we must recognize is that moving forward, it's here. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure that it's, it stays here for, for future residents. And it's investment that we've made as a city of Santa Rosa and one that we must continue to make and make sure that we assure it's here. And I understand there's issues with the park, but it's something that we are definitely trying to address so the next council, the next generation doesn't have to. So it's definitely trying to take off the band aid and, and cure the wound, uh, so to speak. So I do thank you, Jen. Thank you. Councilmember Stapp. Thank you, Councilmember Council Alvarez. Uh, just a quick follow up on that, and actually in response to a couple of the callers. Um, sometimes the Bennett Valley Golf Course is talked about as though it was the Bennett Valley Country Club. That's not what it is. It's a, it's a public course. And that's a, there, there's a very different culture there to anybody who, who has played the game or visited the course than if we were talking about a private club. And many of us here on the dais have had the, have enjoyed um, being part or, or playing at the Bennett Valley Country Club or Bennett Valley, sorry, Bennett Valley Golf Course. And if you go and you hang out at the driving range or you're on the course, you're seeing you're seeing a broad swath of the city. Golf has an elitist reputation, unfortunately, and some of that's some of that's deserved. But that's not what you find when you go to, to the Bennett Valley Golf Course um, or an, another golf course in the area at um, at the fairgrounds. You're just you're going to see a lot of a lot of local families from all across the city, from all across the county, enjoying that park setting. So that that's what we're trying to preserve here. Um, and I just had one question. Uh, it is about. How are we, $2 million is a lot of money. What measures are we taking to try to increase the diversity and diversify what is offered at the golf course so that we have more uh, youth there, people from like Southwest Santa Rosa, people from all over coming to play. And I know we have some programs, so in responding to some of the comments, I just want to, I want to say that the council has looked at that. It, it, we have made it a priority. Um, Touchstone has agreed to make it a priority, but exactly what those programs are, I don't know. So if you can let me know, that would be great. Sure, I, I would be happy to do that, but the best person to do that I would like to call if somebody from Touchstone can come down to talk about the programs. They have a wide variety of programs. Um, that they offer and we're continuing to work with them on how we can diversify uh, different programs and how we can use the programs that we have in recreation to match up students to to golf but i'll turn it over to the experts here to talk about the programs they have running right now hello my name is greg anderson i'm the general manager at uh, benna valley golf course in iron and mine restaurant and um, it's been an honor for us to be involved with the property. And one of the fun things that I, I have done historically throughout my career is uh, been a, um, a junior golf is a, is a foundation of every program where I've developed a, um, a golf entity. So what we have done is we've developed a junior golf program, um, which is a year-long program. We have a in, in programs going right, right, right now that are year-long, and, and we are reaching out to 
all the schools that let them know. I reached out to the athletic director at L.C. Allen School, let them know that they dropped their, their golf program last year. And it's important for me that, or actually it's during the pandemic they dropped their pro program. It's important to me to get them back into the, the stable again and, and utilize our golf course uh, for, for their golfers. Um, Montgomery High School, their girls team this year that is local and you know we 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 might be talking about you know another part of town but their high school team this year has gone on from 10 girls last year to they have 24 people that showed up um so uh i've just introduced myself to boys and girls clubs of um, uh, Sonoma County and uh, Nevada or Marin County um, that we are going to raise funds for them so they can come out and participate in golf and um, not only as a, a sport but also as a vocation. Uh, show them that golf and uh, show that the business of golf if, if they have an interest, have an interest in, in that type of activity. Um, seniors, we're, we have many senior clubs at our, at our club and they're they're improving and advancing every day about more activities that we're doing at the club, uh, which includes, you know, just simply throwing a meal into their their um, their golf round and things that are just make it more enticing to get there. Um, so we're we're doing everything that we're we're meant to do, and you know, and as I'm talking about this, is uh, I look forward to this getting a little more enhanced as we go, but. Uh, being our first year there, I think our junior programs is a great start in getting our little more diverse in what we're doing. Thank you very much for answering that question for me. Are there any other questions or comments from Council, Councilmember Alvarez? Sir, I appreciate what you're doing with the youth, especially the junior program, and I understand that you're working with Sonoma and Marin Boys and Girls Club, yeah. and I just want to let you know there's actually a Roseland Boys and Girls Club that I would love for you to approach and, and, oh, sure. and make that, that make that invitation as well. Right. I, I, me personally, the only time I've been golfing was at the driving range. I ended up with blisters and I never tried it again, <laughs> but I'm sure there's people out there that would love to learn the sport and probably are very good at it, and they just don't know that they are, but I appreciate your efforts. Please introduce me to them, you know, and just uh, send me their, their messaging who, who I should be in I would love with. to do so and I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no additional questions or comments, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Councilmember Stepp? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you for the presentation. We're now going to be moving on to item 14.4. City Item four. Oh, I'm sorry. Item 14.4 is a report, diversity of, diversity of city council boards, commissions, and committees. Good evening, Vice Mayor, Mayor Rogers, and Council, Dean Amana, City Clerk, providing the report on Boards, Commissions, and Committees Diversity Report for 2022. The following slides re will review the charter requirements for this report, including review of the total number of applications and appointments in a given year, the relevant diversity information on ethnicity, gender, and geography, and some additional data that was requested at last year's 2018 through 2021 diversity catch-up report. Section 11 of the city charter requires reporting on the following boards and commissions and committees. And while this section of the charter states it shall not apply to a district commission, which is now called the community advisory board, uh, the personnel board, the board of building regulations, appeals, and the housing authority boards, we felt it was important to include those statistics because council makes appointments on those boards as well. 
The 2022 overview includes um, 66 applications received, 46 of which were unique. 93% of those um, applications provided gender information, 96% provided race and ethnicity information, and 96% also provided home addresses that could be mapped. In 2022, the appointees were a total of 23 appointments, and 100% of the appointees provided gender, race, or ethnicity, and geographical information. As you can see by this table, which is in the report, the gender of applicants is 59% male, 35% female, with 0% non-binary or third gender and prefer to self-describe, 1% or pardon me, 2% prefer not to say, and 4% provided no response. The gender of appointees breaks down to 74% male and 26% female. The remaining categories of non-binary, third gender, prefer to self-describe and prefer not to say is zero. The attached report also includes a table breakdown by board, but for this presentation, I wanted to expedite it and move um, highlight later on the new data as requested last year during the district or by district and appointing authority. Here you have the breakdown between gender of appointees by district. Uh, of the 23 appointments made in 2022, six were female, 17 were male, or 26% female and 74% male. And while this table reflects the district specific appointments, they are not council member appointee specific or appointing authority specific as council members still have the flexibility to appoint from outside their council district. This table breaks down the gender of appointees by appointing authority. Uh, as you will see, this table shows seven different council members appointments for 2022, two council members of which are no longer serving on the council but made appointments in 2022. And council member Okrepke made a number of appointments in early December shortly after being seated, while other newly seated council members made appointments early on in 2023, and that data will be reported in 2023. Councilmember Fleming does not show on this table. However, um, she did not have any appointments to fill in 2022. She had made her appointments previously. The ethnicity of applicants breaks down to 63% Caucasian non-Hispanic, 13% Hispanic, 2% with no response, 11% as other, 2% as prefer not to say, 2% of the population of the applicants was African American, and 2% was American Indian, Alaskan Native Aleutian, and 5% was Asian or Pacific Islander. The ethnicity of appointee breakdown includes um, African American equals 13% of appointees, but makes up only 2% of our applicants. Asian or Pacific Islander equals 5% uh, of our appointees and make up 5% of the applicant pool. Caucasian non-Hispanic equals 78% of the appointees and makes up 63% of the applicants. And Hispanic appointees make up 4%, but Hispanic make up 13% of the applicant pool. This table breaks down the ethnicity of appointees by district. And this table breaks down the, appointing, uh, the appointees by appointing authority. Again, you can see African American, we had a total of three appointments. Asian or Pacific Islanders, a total of one appointment. Caucasian, non-Hispanic, 18 appointments. And one Hispanic appointment. This is a geographic of applicants by um, CAB district. Uh, now, Staff determined based on the language of the charter requirement to be sure to include it um, or this table by CAP district rather than strictly council district only because that is what is required within the charter language. And you can see 30% uh, of our applicants were from the Northeast CAP section. 
Uh, 20% were from the northwest section, 20% were from the southeast section, 15% of the from the southwest, 11% from the central core, and we had 4% with no response. This table breaks, or this graph breaks down the geographics of the appointees. So we had 17% of appointees from the northeast, 22% from the northwest, 9% from the southeast, 17 from the southwest, and 35% from the central core. This table of geographics by appointee, again, is based on the cab districts rather than the city council districts. And this is by board. We're going to move into the council member snapshots. And this is as of the reporting date when we built this report um, two weeks ago with um, from August. And it will continue to grow and show different data for each reporting year to reflect the trends of the appointment diversity. Uh, just to note, each council member is responsible for 10 board appointments with 25 board appointments by the full council. I'm not going to read every category for, by every council member, just to keep things moving along, but I'll leave it up for a minute or two or a moment or two. You can see here we have District 1 and District 2 for Alvarez and Stepp. District 3 and District 4 for Vice Mayor McDonald and Council Member Fleming, respectively. Districts 5 and 6 for Council Members Rogers and Okrepke. And District 7 and the full Council appointments. And for Mayor Rogers is District 7. And I wouldn't anticipate a great deal of change on these tables at the next reporting period. I suspect that will come in the years um, following as we get on a more routine uh, reporting schedule. And we'll have more depth to the story of our diversity story. This is the trend chart over years. It's a lot of information. Um, and I can, I'm going to move forward to the charts, which makes the summer, summary a little clearer. So the gender trends are staying generally close for the last three years. 35 to 45% of our applicants have been female and 50 to 60% male with 6% with no response. And out of curiosity, I checked our census data, which shows our population is 51.4% female and 49% male. This is the table of ethnicity of applicants over time. I'm remaining silent so you can draw your own conclusions to what this data is telling you. And again, to compare to census data on ethnicity, uh, and again, this data was pulled from census.gov quick facts for Santa Rosa. Caucasian and non-Hispanic applicants is steadily at 63% 63, 63 of the applicant pool, while our census data shows our population is 62.3% Caucasian and non-Hispanic. Our Hispanic applicant three-year average is 10%, while our population is 34% Hispanic. 6% of our applicant pool is black or African American alone, while our census data shows that we are composed of 2% black or African, African American in our community. Our Asian Pacific Islander three-year average of applicants is 3%, while our census data shows uh, Asian alone is 5.9% of our population, and other Pacific Islander is at 0.4%. American Indian and Alaskan Native Aleutian is 1% of our applicant pool and 1.2% of our ethnicity makeup. The other and multiracial category makes up 10% of our applicant pool and 8.9% of our population. The remaining 7% of our three-year average is seven for prefer not to say or no response.
The geographics of applicant over time is presented on this slide, and you can see that we had a point in time in 2019 and 2020 where our clusters were a little bit closer, um, but you can see in 2021 we had a, a higher turnout or a, a greater diversity or a greater amount of applicants from the northwest and the northeast portion of Santa Rosa significantly greater than 2019 and 2020. So the final thoughts on this report, this expanded reporting highlights the value of self-reports by appointees, which is what all of this data is based on when they apply through the public portal at srcity.org forward slash boards and submit their application, they self-report all of this uh, diversity information. Um, this report shows the additional data as requested in the 2022 report catch up that Stephanie Williams provided last year. And I think it does speak to council's ongoing commitment to diversity and inclusion, but it also highlights the need for continued efforts by all. To conclude, it is recommended by the city clerk's office that the council by motion accept the 2022 annual reports of diversity of city council appointees and provide feedback to staff on any future reports. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Looking to council, if there's any questions on the report. Council Member Fleming. Yes, thank you so much for taking the time to do this for us. I think it's helpful for, for me to see, you know, where I can do better. I do have a question around age breakdowns. Would it be legal to ask people what age range they, they fit into when when we're asking for applications? I'd want to be sure that it relates to um, the commission that they're serving on. Does their gender relate to the commission that they're serving on? I, I mean, for me, it just may be helpful to, to know to make sure that I have more diversity and representation. I'm, I'm sorry, King, I didn't hear you. Sorry, uh, on the applications that I've seen, I mean, they ask that information. It's just voluntary. They don't have to mark. It. Oh, sure, of course. I'm just wondering if, if we do ask that uh, their age is voluntary and is it legal to do, if it's legal to do so if we didn't already do it? I believe in, uh, in 2022 mid-year, we um, started capturing that data, but we were not asked to report out on it. Okay. Um, well. If you find yourself with extra time and want to share that with us going forward, I think that that might, I think that that's probably the next frontier for us to in, in being even more diverse is making sure that we have broad age representation. Thank you, duly noted. <laughs> but this was great, don't, that's not what I mean. <laughs> this is lovely. Thank you, Councilmember Fleming. Mayor Rogers. Uh, Dina, I probably should know this, but I don't. Uh, 46 unique. So what that means is we received a total of 66 applications to boards. That might mean that you apply to five different boards. So there are fewer um, or there are unique applicants, but you might have submitted six. Council Member Okrepke might have submitted two. Therefore, we had a total of 66 applications. I wouldn't have guessed that one. Thank you. Any more questions? Madam City Clerk, will you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Vice Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 14.4. If you are in council chamber and would like to comment but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. If you are participating via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. I'm gonna turn it over to our Zoom host as I see no one in council chamber approaching the podium. Thank you, Shelby. I'm allowing your permissions. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good evening. Um, I see that the press Democrat has remained true to his word to keep us under 3% of the population. Thank you for putting out the report that we only make up 2% of reported individuals. I did see it said something about 6% and I'll get some more clarification on what those two numbers meant. Um, in this report, though, I mean, I know we all have eyeballs. I know we do. We all can see with our own two eyes. 
coming up with this non-binary uh, tracking data for individuals who have their own personal mental illness is not something we should be recording. Those people have respect to their privacy, in all honesty. So just like you're sharing people's medical information, now you're going to share their sexuality with us? When is this going to stop? Like, I appreciate everybody has a look at how they want to be portrayed. But in this data, let's talk about the fact that the people who make up most of these boards are Caucasian, no matter how you break down the numbers. Let's talk about people who are part of the community on the outskirts of places like Roseland and never have lived there, but are in positions of power over that place. Let's talk about the fact that Let's talk about a couple of things when we're talking about the equity in this community, the bias that is being put forth. I appreciate you guys capturing what data you have. I think people's ages really do matter. And that was a good point that was brought up, but it is voluntary information. Some of those people who don't want to say what they are probably are others. I would be classified as that, even though I don't classify myself as that. I appreciate the fact that you guys are taking the consideration to look at these demographics and this data. Now let's actually do something about this data and implement some changes. I'm no longer a member of your community, but what your community does influences communities surrounding them. And since everybody looks to you guys as the people of wisdom, I have to make sure that you guys are playing honest. Because when you have communities made up of 2% of us, and you're delegating responsibility, you come to my community, we make up a bigger percentage and we don't go like that. Thank you. Thank you. Adina, you're up next. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good evening, Council. I appreciate these statistics to show the breakdown of demographics within the city of Santa Rosa. That being said, as Mr. Pryor mentioned, I am one of the individuals that falls within the group known as other, being somebody who's biracial. Although our government preaches that integration is accepted, it's absolutely not. And I live that firsthand, yet I'm told I'm not allowed to have that opinion daily uh, by people who happen to be primarily Caucasian. And as I said, I've lived this firsthand. My father was a Caucasian man who was extremely racist. And this is why I've recently been labeled as the largest activist in the entire county of Sonoma for the Press Democrat. I am somebody who's a bridge in my community and I'm able to connect with every group of people and genuinely hear their concerns because I do see equity through a different lens. That being said, I'm also the go-to person in the community because I do keep confidentiality to those who need my help and uh, have come to me to share their concerns. And primarily the people that come to me happen to be minorities who are afraid to speak up because they see how I've been attacked by the entire community. As somebody who graduated top in my high school, and college class and only didn't attend Stanford because my mother was dying of stage 4B uterine cancer. So I don't appreciate the treatment that I get in the community. Minorities are afraid to speak up and that's why I have Honey Badger who's six foot five, Mr. Pryor next to me, just so my own voice can be heard. But we wanna make sure that everybody's voice is heard. So when we're talking about these demographics, Many people who are minority serving in positions of power are simply puppets, not because they want to be, but they feel forced because if they go against a narrative, 
they'll be exiled by their entire community. And that is very apparent in Sonoma County. I've lost count of the stories that have been brought to my attention and bring tears to myself. I can't imagine how those individuals feel who happen to be much darker in pigment than I am. Um, and the racism is just out of hand. It was labeled as a public health crisis in the city of Santa Rosa, yet our equity director for the county of Sonoma allocated $3 million in ARPA funds to her own nonprofit. None of this is about equity. Equity is a term to simply move money to nonprofits that are tax exempt. So I'd appreciate legitimate representation for our communities of color. Thank you. Zoom user. Please go ahead when you're ready. Zoom user, are you wishing to speak? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I find it kind of amusing that you even talk about equity and diversity at this point because at the end of the last thing you guys were just talking about, um, one of the board members actually had to ask to have Roseland added to that. And, but you guys had already added Marin County and other areas of Santa Rosa, but one of the poorer communities was never even asked about the golf course. So, and then you guys all continued to vote for it after that was said, and the Boys and Girls Club guy had to actually asked to have that information sent to them. So talking about diversity and equity, that's ridiculous. You people, you don't practice what you preach. You put it up there to make it look like you care. And it just doesn't, it seems to go right over your head. And for some reason, your community members keep voting for you. And because you go out and do a couple walks with them and act like you care. So why don't you actually start voting on stuff that makes sense? Why don't you actually start caring about your community instead of lining your pockets with all the bullshit. Thank you. That concludes public comment on Zoom and we have no pre-recorded messages for this item. Thank you, bringing it back to council. Are there any further questions? Council member Krepke. Yeah, um, I'm curious, just after hearing um, what was it, 48, for, 48 unique for 66 positions? Is that correct? Somewhere in that ballpark? We had 46 unique applicants, uh, 66 total applications for, for 40. we had uh, each council member appoints 10 council members, mm -hmm. or board members, and council makes 25 full council appointments to boards and commissions. There's a total of 95 position, uh, okay. board and commission positions. So ideally for Ideally, f you would have more applications for each position than half, than one application for each two positions as, as the math works out. So my question is, um, how are we advertising these openings? How are we advertising um, that we're taking applications? And two, is staff working on or, or hypothesizing or brainstorming ways to increase the way in which we make the public uh, notified of these, of these uh, openings? Actually, yes. Um, so we advertise in the Press Democrat as uh, annually uh, just to build a depth of applications that we have on file if a vacancy comes up. We also, uh, ahead of the application cycle, uh, for newly seated council members, we do a large recruitment. Um, and then as needed, we recruit through the Press Democrat, Lavos, all of our um, digital platforms or social media platforms like Facebook, um, Twitter, our City Connections newsletter. We are making greater efforts to work with our community partners for recruitment efforts. Um, we have identified that we could be doing better. And we are, um, especially after generating this report, we are, um, the deputy city clerk and myself have committed to making sure we're definitely reaching out to our community partners and thinking outside the box for recruitments. There might be some opportunities some of the brainstorming we've been doing is having booths at some of our community events or a, an approach to election season, um, having a more forward face on our recruitment efforts for boards and commissions. Additionally, COVID kind of sidelined some of our 
um, recruitment efforts. We used to have a uh, annual or pre-election cycle or during election cycle recruitment meeting here in council chambers. We'd invite members of the community. We'd advertise on those same platforms I just mentioned. And we'd go over what all the boards and commissions do um, how you can serve on those boards, what the criteria is to serve. Um, we haven't gotten back to it, and so it's on my agenda to get us back to that, maybe not this year, but early next uh, election cycle. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Seeing no further questions, I'll go to Council Member Rogers to put a motion on the floor. All right, thank you so much, Vice Mayor. I will make a motion for the Council to accept the 2022 Boards and Commissions Diversity Report. Second. Seeing it on the motion from Council Member Rogers, seconded by Mayor Rogers. Is there any more discussion? Madam City Clerk, oh, pardon me, sorry. Council Member Fleming. Um, I just had one thing I wanted to add to this, which is that I, I appreciate that we're all working so hard to to do better by our community, and I think that you know, this is a, something that takes a long time and requires just constant attention. And the thing that, that struck me the most about it is that the group that did the, the least equitable job was the council as a whole. And that each of us did better on our own than the council did collectively, bearing in mind that two of our current members are not here. We're not here for those decisions that we made last year. And so I just, you know, I'm, I want to commit to being more mindful when we're meeting in public and what some of the barriers could be to awarding those appointments when we all meet together. And I look forward to doing that with you all. Thank you, Council Member, or pardon me, Mayor Rogers. Um, and I just want to thank the clerk's office because uh, at the time being a new council member, I figured out how hard it was to get people to sign up to do this. Um, so the fact that you're looking at going to them to tell them about what we're doing, I think is an awesome idea and it's thinking out of the box and that's what we need if we're gonna continue to diversify, not only our, our boards and commissions, but the council itself. Thank you. Okay. Madam City Clerk, will you please uh, call vote? Thank you, Council Member Stapp. Aye. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Okrepke. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Aye. Council Member Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show this passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you so much. Now moving on to item 14.5, Madam City Manager, will you please introduce the item? Item 14.5 is a report, appointment of city attorney, approval of city attorney employment agreement, and introduction of ordinance setting city attorney salary. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, this is kind of a culmination of what we've gone through to appoint the new City Attorney. Um, so a little bit of the background. Our current City Attorney, Sue Gallagher, retired from her position as City Attorney back in July 28th. And after a nationwide recruitment selection process and candidate interviews, the City Council intends to appoint Teresa Stricker as the City Attorney. Council has reached satisfactory terms and conditions for the employment contract. Um, let's see, the agreement will commence on November 6 of 2023, and the city charter requires that the compensation for the salary of the city attorney be established by ordinance, and a proposed ordinance is included for adoption by council. And the salary is set at the amount of 24,500 per month or 294,000 annually effective November 6 of 2023. And then this is kind of a culmination of the salary and benefits that is within the employment agreement. And I'm gonna run through it real quick. So the annual salary for the city attorney is being established at $294,000 annually. 
deferred compensation or a 457. City con contribution is a 5.5% of base salary. Moving relocation expenses is a not to exceed amount of 10,000 and receipts moving to Marin and Sonoma County. The severance within the contract is for six months. Vacation, she'll have an initial bank of 160 hours. Sick leave, an initial bank of 96 hours, and it will follow the executive management unit 10's accrual rate. Admin leave also follows unit 10's accrual rate, which is 80 hours every July 1st, and it does not accumulate. Holidays follow the same executive management as unit 10, a term life insurance policy of 250,000, and auto allowance of $350 a month, a wellness benefit of $400 a month, and any other benefits that are done through the Executive Managed Unit 10 MOU. And there is a reimbursement payment to, for the state bar dues and a membership in up to two CLA sections. So it is the recommendation that the council by resolution appoint Teresa Stricker to the position of city attorney and approve the employment agreement titled city attorney. It is further recommended that the council introduce an ordinance establishing the salary of the city attorney in the amount of 24,500 per month or $294,000 annually effective November 6th of 2023. And that is the conclusion of the presentation and that I wasn't sure if the interim city attorney Samantha had anything she wanted to add you did an excellent job <laughs> I have nothing to add all right and then I wanted to just briefly introduce Teresa Stricker she is sitting in our audience so that is it <laughs> and that is the conclusion of the presentation looking to council to see if there's any questions Okay, seeing none, Madam City Clerk, will you please facilitate public comment? Certainly, Vice Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 14.5. If you're in council chamber and would like to comment but have not provided a speaker card, please make your way to the podium. If you're participating via Zoom, please dial star nine or raise your hand. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. One moment. Did you need the projector? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. This is Eric Frazier, Concerned Citizen of Santa Rosa. Uh, that's really quite a, a marker for the amount of compensation for a city of attorney, but I imagine that's the going rate. What I wanted to address is I know that the city attorney is the attorney for city business, so they don't represent individual employees, they don't represent city council people, they don't represent the city citizens. Um, but yet they are bound by the Constitution, as are all the elected people on the uh, dais, as well as the staff, senior staff, all governed by the Constitution. And there's a crisis in the city. The crisis is because there's a lot of corruption. For instance, in the code enforcement area, a senior code enforcement officer was arrested, not her first arrest, uh, and yesterday we received the public document on the felony complaint. Now, the name of the person doesn't really matter to me, quite frankly. Everybody is entitled to justice. Uh, and she has not been adjudicated uh, for the crimes that they claim, but the crimes are serious. The crimes involved uh, claim great violence, great bodily harm, threat of violence. This is against an elder person. This was done under the threat of law, under the color of law. They were acting in their professional opinion. They came forward and they were already on probation. They already had a record, but they were hired as a senior, <laughs> senior inspector for the city. Uh, so the defendant took advantage of a position of trust. Uh, furthermore, this uh, alleges that the defendant engaged in violent conduct that indicates a serious danger to society and involves juvenile delinquency on top of it, um, previous felonies, yet they were hired. They were hired. 
And not only that, but there's a huge um, history of code enforcement shenanigans. Many code enforcement violations uh, were issued incorrectly and had to be clawed back. In the short-term rental space, there's definitely documented histories of abuse by code enforcement. So I guess my question is, since everybody on the dais swears an oath to the Constitution, our, our city attorney does, who actually represents the city? There's been no information about this in the public. I know you guys pay the press Democrats, so they're not going to report on it. Who actually is able to v pierce through the corruption that's happening in the city, rather than just sweeping it under the rug? paying more to an attorney. Is this part of a bribe money? What is going on here? These are very, very serious problems, and you're not being honest with the people of Santa Rosa. Thank you. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no additional public comments from Council Chamber. I'm going to turn it to our Zoom host who facilitate public comments via Zoom. Thank you. Adina, please go ahead when you're ready. Good evening, Council. I would like to echo the concerns stated by Mr. Frazier regarding city business under the city attorney. It is concerning that Ms. Abudara, the former uh, head of code enforcement, was arrested with potential felony charges. I did request for the Press Democrat to cover that story months ago and they refused. They, they also s scrubbed it completely from the Google SEO. Uh, you cannot find it. However, it appears, uh, the rest appears in other alternate search engines. So that's very interesting. And many people, as an investigative journalist at the California Globe, have come forward to me regarding similar stories of extortion yet they are being shunned and pushed away by both the county and the city. So I'm not sure why their complaints are not being addressed. I found it interesting that Ms. Abudara previously shared the same residential address as Ms. Virginia Rom, Sonoma County Supervisor Gore's uh, grandmother. And so there are many questions with city business that aren't being addressed, yet the press democrat emailed me today again stated i'm the number one activist in the county and is asking me where i live and how i have a source of income and personal questions that as a journalist are absolutely inappropriate so i'd appreciate i do have probably thousands of questions at this point as i'm sure does mr frazier i connected with him because i was so impressed by his research within the press democrat comments his public records requests and inquiries echoed my own, and I was not aware that any other private citizen was putting such tremendous amount of, an amount of time um, into seeking justice and transparency within the community. Um, it's concerning for us as constituents to be threatened and harassed, such as myself. Obviously, I was uh, illegally terminated from my position as the executive assistant to the board and superintendent of Santa Rosa Schools. To date, uh, over a two-year period, I've not been able to get a single inquiry answered unless there is an attorney attached to the email threatening me or threatening me that I'm going to be arrested for asking questions and things of that sort. So it's very concerning. Our stakeholders share the same concerns as myself. They're just afraid to speak up because they don't want to be ostracized and my faith tells me that I must move forward regardless of the repercussions, but 99.9% .9 of people are not going to do so. So Mr. Frazier is a blessing for uh, the community, which I don't even live there any longer. So thank you. Thank you. We have no additional public comment on Zoom and no pre-recorded messages. Thank you so much. Bringing it back to council for any questions. Okay, Mayor, Mayor Rogers. Um, I just wanted to take the time to congratulate you and welcome you to the team. And I'm really looking forward um, to working with you. So thank you very much for your willingness to come to Santa Rosa and serve.
Thank you. Looking to Council Member Alvarez to put the both items on the floor. We'll go to the resolution first for adoption. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. I waive a reading of the text and adopt resolution entitled Resolution of the Council of the City of San Rosa appointing a city attorney and approving an employment contract for the city attorney position. Second. Madam City Clerk, will you please facilitate the roll call vote? Can you please announce the second? Pardon me. Councilman Rogers. Me. Thank you. Councilmember Stapp? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Let the record show this passes with seven affirmative votes. Thank you. Councilmember Alvarez, will you please go to the adoption of the ordinance and put that on the floor for consideration? Thank you. Uh, waving reading of the text uh, and adopting ordinance entitled Ordinance of the Council of the City of San Rosa establishing monthly salary of 24500 and other compensation and benefits for the city attorney. Second. I do want to clarify it as an introduction of the ordinance. We'll have to adopt it second read at the next council meeting. So are you looking for a roll call vote on it or not? I just want to make sure it is acknowledged that as an introduction of the ordinance is the motion on the floor. Yes. So yes, we want to do an adoption of this today. We're doing an introduction, and Madam City Clerk is just clarifying for record that this is an introduction, and we will come back for the adoption. Am I correct? Thank you. May we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Stepp? Aye. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? Aye. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Alvarez? Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald? Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show the ordinance was introduced with seven affirmative votes. Now moving on to item 16, written communications. We have 16.1 state legislative updates that are there for information as well as 16.2, a notice of a final map. Madam City Clerk, will you please facilitate public comment on item 16. We are now yep, thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 16. See no one in council chamber, but if you are participating via Zoom and wish to provide comment, please raise your hand or dial star 9. Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no hands being raised via Zoom and no one in the council chamber to provide public comment. Thank you so much. I'll bring it back to council for any comments on item 16. Councilmember Rogers, sorry about that. No, I appreciate it, and uh, I think we all, uh, through various channels, have, have heard about ACA 13, which was introduced last week. Uh, I know it is going to be a priority of Cal Cities, and so I want to put that on everyone's radar and see if it would be possible for the mayor to review it for a potential letter of support. Uh, ACA 13 actually would be a constitutional amendment for the March ballot uh, that I think is a, a key one for us to keep an eye on. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll now go to item 17, our last public comment on non-agenda items for tonight. Thank you, Vice Mayor. We are now taking public comments on item 17, non-agenda matters. If you'd like to provide public comment and you are participating via Zoom, please dial star nine or raise your hand. Uh, Vice Mayor, I'm seeing no one in council chamber wishing to provide public comment, but we do have a hand raised in Zoom, so I'll turn it over to our Zoom host. Thank you, Shelby. I'm allowing your permissions. Please go ahead when you're ready. Good evening, council. This is a good opportunity for me to talk about something that really does get us in a step of forward in equity. I would like to see us, the community of Sonoma, come up with a cultural center for African-American dissented people. I want this space to be a cultural center 
for people who are black to come and congregate and have a safe place to celebrate their culture. I don't know where you can come up with the funds to help the golf course because it's a jewel. I'd like to see that golf course be uh, reaching out to the Roseland area, reaching out to the outward communities of Richmond and Oakland and Vallejo, Fairfield, Sacramento, Natomas. Let's talk about bringing communities of diversity into this into this game. I would like to see these steps be taken with a great sense of urgency. The community members need to have the ability to connect in spaces where we can have these conversations that are tough for people in this capacity to understand alone based off of history that isn't shared with us. I thank you very much for taking me serious at times even when you may agree or disagree with some of the things I say or do or feel or whatever. I hope it doesn't hit deaf ears. This is a step forward for this community to also be acknowledged. I appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. That concludes public comment on Zoom, and we have no pre-recording messages. Thank you. Bringing it back, we are going into adjournment at 8.17. Thank you.